Hi, friends, and welcome to Screen Vomit, the only movie podcast for normal people. I'm, of course, your host, Kayla, and I do have some guests with me today, two guests, in fact. But before I get to that, um, let me go ahead and plug my own crap. You can find the show, if you like it, at Screen Vomit on Instagram and everywhere else. I got t-shirts for sale, links in my link tree, and I have a little bit of an announcement. This is sort of a save the date moment because it's kind of far off, but I haven't said it anywhere yet. So on November 11th, 1111, if you will, for LA folks, I'm going to be doing a screening, a little short films block um, in LA. So if you're an LA person, mark your little calendars for that 1111. It's been a while since I've dropped an ep and I miss y'all when I'm not posting eps, but I have eps in the can to be posting. Um, I'm still sort of catching up my energy from doing a gigantic monumental event in June that absolutely destroyed my mind and body. But guess what? We'll get there. I'm just trying to have patience with myself in this process. So um, bear with me, but uh, thank you for sticking with me if you have and thanks for joining in if you're new. So let me get to my guests today. I have with me two celebs. I have Al Warren and Michael Bible, who are filmmakers. Michael's also a writer. I have been such a huge fan of Al's work for a really long time. And so it's so cool to have him on. The both of them just made a new movie called Dog Leg, which is sort of doing, it's sort of touring in a way that a band does, I guess, <laughs> at the moment. Um, so they're kind of all over. It's not really out, but it's screening places. So at the moment, their currently announced dates are September 1, 2, and 27 at Brain Dead Studios in LA, September 21st at Beacon Theater in Seattle, September 23rd and 24th at Linwood Theater on Bainbridge Island, Washington State. More dates in North America and Europe are coming for October and November. So make sure you follow them on Instagram. They drop their handles at the end of the ep. All their stuff is there. I also have those linked in the show notes here. I'm so excited to have them on. I hadn't seen their movie at the time of recording, but I've seen it since and it's really good. It's really fun. So you should definitely go see it. Support indie film hashtag. A couple other notes about the ep. We talk about a short that Al and Mike had made called Shadow Man. So technically they had not released it, but I found it online and shared it one day. So we talk about that. So that's just sort of context. Um, I made it my short of the day one day uh, and it was technically kind of a private link, but I found it online. So to me, that's public. Anyway, they weren't mad about it, but we do talk about it in the app and that's sort of the context. Michael's audio is a little sketchy. So sorry about that. Uh, His actual recorded track got goofed. So I had to use the Zoom audio and Zoom audio famously, not incredible. And then thirdly, I mentioned a movie in the After Dark called Reality that was just like a super DIY Chicago film that I found by accident. So I just went ahead and linked that in the show notes too, just for fun. It's really insane movie. Um, So I don't know, it's there if you want to check it out. Anyway, so I'm super excited for this ep to be out, babe. Go and see their movie Dog Leg and here's the ep. (laughs) Thank you, Patreon subscribers. uh, 50% (laughs) off this week with Blue Box (laughs) Home Good Foods. Featuring fresh. Oh yeah. <laughs> how, I'm wondering how much, hmm. how much really is Mark Maron getting paid for that shit? Because if uh, he interviews someone that you like, I find myself like having to skip every three minutes because they'll just jump in <laughs> with the shit. Yeah. It's like, are you losing, fellas? Are then- you losing your libido? <laughs> I remember, and he kind of like talks about it for a second. He has like a tag. And the ads are long, long too. As fuck, they're the, like five. They're minutes. way too long. Yeah, he'll go, he'll go like thirty seconds of just thinking about it. He'll be like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, doing a lot of skipping when you're listening to actual um, popular podcasts <laughs> with celebrities on them. Right. I'm not trying to do all that. <laughs> You've got two massive celebrities here today. We want the audience to stick around and just enjoy the genuine combo. And you know what? I'm giving this to you ad free. So out of the kindness of my heart, I don't get paid a damn dime for this shit. <laughs> they don't want to know how much we're being paid for this. So <laughs> also not a damn dime. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Damn. I don't have no dimes to spare. Okay. Okay. But I do have some celebs in the house. Al, I do have a confession to make a little bit. I got to come out as I'm probably one of the biggest 
Christopher Borgley fans, which means that I've seen the shorts that many shorts that you're in probably dozens of times. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a favorite? Probably a former cult member, mm. but a favorite of your characters is probably Ear, mm. the Ear character. Well, you get to be nasty. And I Good love a nasty, nasty character. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I haven't posted about it yet, but did you see the promo that we did for his uh, film Sick of Myself? Yeah. Okay. Where he gets shot? Yeah. Yeah, that rocked. <laughs> Thank you. I think I've seen, uh, I mean, pretty much everything that he's made that I can find. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> Shy confession. He's great. <laughs> I'm a bit of a short film head, so okay. that's kind of my thing. Yeah. I love short films. I mean, you've now seen Within the Last Week. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> I've found a couple of ones that you've created. Yeah. But uh, it's sorry for uh, accidentally spilling the beans on that one today. You know what? Yes, it was I kind of good. Like, I've had mm. that on my site and just never promoted it. There was like a time where we were going to premiere it with this one group and then... Um, What's it called? Shadow Man? Was that it? Yeah, that's what... It, I'm guessing. Yeah, Shadow Man. And... Uh, Michael and I were writing a lot during the pandemic. We were mm -hmm. making dog leg, but like everything was super halted, obviously. Mm -hmm. We were kind of just like writing every day. We, I think we wrote like nine different scripts. And then I would yeah. show them to my friend who's also my DP who lived right up the street. And Shadow Man was one that we felt like we could do safely. Yeah. We shot it at my house with my dog and my friends. And yeah, I don't know. We just never released it. So it was kind of serendipitous. You know, what's funny, too, <laughs> is the guy that plays the Shadow Man is the producer of uh, all of those Chris Borgley shorts that you were mentioning. Oh, yeah. And he <laughs> hit me up this morning asking for a link to it because he was trying to reference some sound design stuff for a project he's working on. So then really? <laughs> all of a sudden there's all this Shadow Man traction and people are like, oh, my gosh, this is the greatest film I've ever seen. And <laughs> I'm trying to promote another Everyone's film. talking about it. They literally won't shut up about it. And you're like, I've got something else to talk about. Siskel and Ebert <laughs> are literally like blowing my phone up right now. I had to put it on. Do not disturb. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I didn't feel like it was, even though it is technically a private video. <laughs> is it? <laughs> <Fuck>. <laughs> well, it's like the kind where you have to have the link. It's not just like on your Vimeo or whatever. Okay, yeah. But it's on your website, right. which is how I found it. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that's released enough. For sure. It is. It is and it was and we're good. Hell yeah. <laughs> so you guys made this together. Uh, Michael Silent third in the room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Less than away. Alex, that was a uh, true story. Shadow Man? That's, a, that's based on a true story. That was based on a true story. Did that happen to you or me? I can't remember now. To you, to you. Yeah. The uh, you found a weapon. Oh, that I that actually. I thought you were. I thought you were doing a bit right now, Michael. No, no. I mean that serious. Uh, that is true. Okay, so Kayla, aka Me Boy. Yeah. This is what happened. <laughs> I was walking with my now wife and our dog. Wife brag. Wife brag. Exactly. <laughs> it was like truly like two days after the George Floyd protests, which mm -hmm. you know I was there for, and it was just insane. We were right. I lived right in Hollywood, and so that was. Mm -hmm. where where all of the stuff was going down. And we were on a walk and my dog started sniffing something. I walked over to it and it was the barrel of a gun. We were like, what the fuck? And we left it. She was like, don't touch it, you know? And then we came back around the block and it was there. And I was like, I can't not touch it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I picked it you up. You see a gun, you got to grab that thing. You see a gun, grab That's the gun. That's your motto? See the gun, <laughs> grab the gun. So I oh, did. Yeah. And we uh, took it inside. And her brother used to be like military kind of guy. A gun Working freak. like in security, right? And we sent him the picture. We were like, dude, we can't, we don't know what this is. It's just like the barrel of a gun. And he was like, well, that's crazy. We were having that same debate that we have in the movie. Like, do I call the cops? Do we need to call the LAPD? Mm -hmm. Also, like, do we trust? Like, I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't know what the fuck to do. And a few hours later, my brother-in-law called us and said that he had looked, he had like zoomed in on the serial number and he thinks it's a pencil sharpener. <laughs> so my wife went and got a pencil and stuck it into the barrel of the gun and started wow. twisting it and pulled it out. And it was a sharpened pencil. So. <laughs> so the whole gag in the movie was actually real life. That's right. Did you play the Sheryl Crow song? We did. We made love <laughs> to the Sheryl Crow song uh, right as she pulled out the uh, <laughs> pencil. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm a virgin. Nasty. I'm a virgin. <laughs> so what is y'all's meet cute? Are you, you're both Mississippi boys. Is this the beginning? Is that the origin? Yeah. Uh, we met in Mississippi. I'm from North Carolina originally, but we were both living there at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our meet cute, I think I destroyed a, a Harry Potter book. <laughs> I destroyed, I, 
you were out burning books and here comes Al down the street. <laughs> yeah, he just had a really special book. Uh, <laughs> and I ripped it up in front of him. Uh, that's how we became friends. And we've been close friends ever since. Hell yeah. I, I frankly, I think I got you out of it. He was a little addicted. I was a little was a addicted. Of- he ripped it up and kind of showed me the light. I, yeah, Michael and I are part of the same kind of like music scene or like friend group in Mississippi. And Michael was the first of my of any friend that I'd ever had to be published. I thought that was like mm-hmm. really interesting. He made some really interesting books around that time. So I was always a big fan of Michael's. And yeah, there's more to that story. We were, Michael lived in a place with some other musicians and we were like jamming like really late one Saturday night. And Michael came home pretty, from the bar, like pretty, uh, pretty keyed up and was just kind of dancing around, like ripping these Harry Potter pages. <laughs> and our friend Dent was like, cool, thanks a lot, Michael. Like Alex was in the middle of that, but whatever. And Michael's like, wait, are you for real? Or are you joking? And I was like, nah, I mean, my mom got me that book for Christmas or whatever, (laughs) but it's all good. It's just like $54 or something. I'll just go to Barnes and Noble tomorrow and get it. And Michael felt so bad about it that he left. And we were like, oh my gosh, he believed us. And so we didn't see him for like an hour. And it's pretty late at this point. And he walks down with an Easter basket full of like some of his favorite belongings, like an iPod. I don't know what all was in there, some socks. And he gave it to me as like a gift to say he was sorry. And I I accepted. And then we didn't tell him for a few days. You said I do. I said I do. (laughs) That was the beginning of that. It was very cute. I have to say it was. It was a mean cute. It literally was. (laughs) Cute. Aww. But that's got to be, is that a long time ago now? When did you start working together? What was the um, getting into film together moment? Yeah. Was there a moment? Well, Michael might be able to speak to his past, but like Michael and I just continued to be really close friends. And I think we would would always kind of talk about what that would feel like to write something together. Michael was Mm -hmm. doing it professionally, working in uh, the writer's room uh, of kind of a bigger showrunner in, in Hollywood for a while before I moved here. And I was just always kind of waiting for a time for there to be something that I could take to him. So uh, Michael and I's first real project, I mean, we, we kind of would get together and like spend time riffing on certain things. I, I think that there's some documents that date back to like 2013. I think our first official thing that we wrote, we wrote with another friend of ours in like 2016. And that took like a couple of years to write. And it was just a movie that was going to be, we still want to make it. It's just too expensive for where we are. Um, and then Michael and I just kind of kept trudging down the path from there. So I, I think officially we've been working together since like 2016. And now you got a big movie coming out. That's right. Is this the first feature for both of y'all? Yeah. That you're creating? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's premiering this week in LA at uh, Brain Dead Cinemas. This won't be out by the, by the time it comes out. No, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say. <laughs> but look out for Wish it. it It'll be out in the fall, yeah. like on streamers. Yeah. We'll check in. Are you doing festivals with it or anything? No, we've no, been invited. You're just going. Yeah, yeah. Going in raw. Yeah, I think that was kind of part of the strategy. Like I, I respect festivals. But I think because of the nature of the way we made this movie and the way that it feels like we were interested in kind of, for better or worse, trying to trudge through uh, creating uh, our own path for the movie. So we're almost treating it like a band this summer. We're playing it in different cities in chunks of screenings at a time. And we've been invited to play a few festivals that I think we'll probably do. Um, But yeah, we just we kind of uh, we kind of made that decision not to try and go the festival route, but to try and create a new way to do it, I guess. And we'll see if that works or not. You know? Hell yeah! So tell the people about the movie. Tell, give them the pitch. The movie is called Dog Leg, mm-hmm. and uh, it follows an amateur film director who loses his girlfriend's dog at a gender reveal party on the morning of a very important shoot. And it kind of oscillates back and forth between the films he's been making up to that point and his search for the dog. And you got some cool peoples in the film. Definitely. It's very much an ensemble film. There's uh, Mm -hmm. a lot of actors that Michael and I both are really big fans of that we were able to get for the movie. And then a lot of non-actors are also in the film who we kind of plucked and fashioned. chased down on the street with a camera. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. We would pin them oh, yeah. down and film them and then get, we, we would put you the moved pin to LA, in their you hand asked for this. to sign yeah. the waiver. <laughs> you used that gun that you found. There you go. 
Is that gone? <laughs> Use it or lose it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's coming out this month, sort of premiering here and there down the road. That's right. Um, and everybody will keep a lookout for it. Cool. Um, and we'll talk more about plugging it later. Okay, great. So now we could get into the movie that we picked to talk about today. Excellent. What do you think? Did you get to okay, cool. watch it? Of course I watched of it. Of course you <laughs> watched it. That would have been a little tough. Alex. Because I didn't watch it either. Did you? No one watched it? I read the letterbox. Oh, yeah. It's this guy named Tony. Let's <laughs> talk about the poster. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so uh, we picked the 2016 film Tony Erdman. Do you say Erdman? I don't know. I haven't said this out loud yet. We're trying it out in the mouth. Um, <laughs> I feel like this the director <laughs> pronounces it Tony Erdman, but I've heard a Erdman? lot of, uh, I've heard Americans talk about it, and for some reason, Americans like to say Erdman. Maybe because there's two it feels ends right. on it. I don't know. Erdman? Tony Erdman. Erdman. Directed by Marinade. So Al picked this movie, sort of. You sent me a list, yeah. and this was on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, a great list, by the way. I was excited about the list. Why was this on the list? You had seen it before? Give me the story. Seen it before? Well, mm -hmm. you had kind of given me um, a 10-year window to work inside of. And I did. I, I think did, yeah. all of the movies that I mentioned I would be interested in talking about had some sort of staying power hour for me they live in your heart definitely and i think that mm -hmm. a lot of the movies too michael and i uh have talked about extensively and i just so you've already done a podcast about this off pod uh -huh. with michael yeah <laughs> we actually recorded two podcasts cool. <laughs> to prepare for this one cool. <laughs> well i hope you still have some left for me <laughs> yeah we'll do our best no i think that this is uh an interesting and somewhat unique movie yeah and i'm glad that you kind of circled this one out of the list because uh immediately i knew that this would be a good a good one to talk about you know yeah i felt that that was true i, I try not to pick stuff that i've already seen because cool. i want to have the discussion about it mm -hmm. i want to not have the thoughts already formed mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah so for me i try and go with stuff i haven't seen so um yeah, this it caught my eye. And then when I, I did look it up on Letterboxd, I didn't really read about it. But I, I just looked to see what my friends think. And it was like 100 people I know have seen it. And they're oh. all like five stars. Mm. So I was like, well, that's got to be probably a good film then. Mm -hmm. So tell us, uh, how did you watch it? Did you watch it back here in your living room theater? <laughs> I did. Which side is it? There TV? it is. There's, there's a big TV right here. So set the stage. Like did you inches. did you like have a <laughs> meal or a drink? It's like a long movie. <laughs> it is a long movie. Um, I feel like it was sort of a day long experience. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. For me, that was pretty much my entire Saturday. Yeah. Um, was watching this movie. Because it, it, when it's so long and it's foreign language, mm. like you got to take little breaks, I feel like, a little bit, just because you can't just be staring at the screen the whole time, you know? Mm. And I don't want to lose focus. Mm -hmm. So I take little breaks. I'm sure I had food. I don't remember. Mm. I did make pancakes mm. on Saturday. Okay. Um, so I've learned how to make the perfect pancake. So I, I believe I sat down with a pancake probably throughout the day i also had an orange i love an orange oh yeah and then i believe at some point there was dinner involved also <laughs> so three meals to watch this movie <laughs> three meal movie <laughs> that's funny also i paid to rent this on amazon prime mm -hmm. uh it is on stars i did forget that i have stars okay so <laughs> i watched it once on prime and once on stars <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Getting all of the experience. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of my journey. So, um, Michael, had you seen this also already before this? I have seen it, but I this was a, a deep watch. <laughs> with a notebook, I really, yeah. bit, bit, you know, bit into it. And I think I had a similar experience. I took it. I took my time with it. I took some breaks. Yeah. The cakes and oranges probably would have been a good option. Mm -hmm. I wish I had thought of that. But mm -hmm. it was a good. It was interesting. It's a lot different than I remember it being. I think I had something in my head at mm -hmm. first from my previous watch that it, it changed a little bit in this watch, but... What was first watch? Was that like theatrical? No, I, I think, Al, you recommended it to me mm -hmm. a couple of years ago when we were sort of talking in dog leg like about you know, what, how we wanted to sort of approach certain things and a certain kind of humor mm -hmm. that this has. And yeah, and I think I watched it sort of, you know, maybe in one chunk and wasn't paying as quite close attention. Yeah. But I remember really, really liking it in certain standout scenes. And then yeah. this watch, I'm like, wow, it's it's a lot different mm -hmm. watch. Really different different than you remembered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Much, yeah. much better. I'm also having to pause to take notes, too. So I don't want to look away from the screen. You miss what they're saying. 
you got to pause for the notes. So that makes it take longer too. When for I'm sure. Watching. Yeah. My, uh, not that you asked either one of you, but my. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't care how you watch it. Yeah. I don't give They're a like, fuck. We're moving on. <laughs> fuck your experience. Oh. I uh, I think it came out in like 2017. 2016. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, but I think it was playing theaters in LA in uh, in 2017, and the Egyptian mm-hmm. was open still, <laughs> and it was my birthday, and I took like a group of maybe like 20 people. And When's your birthday? What time of year? January, the beginning. January, okay. And it was playing, and um, chilly sweater weather. Yep, Someone chilly said. sweater sweater weather. And I I just remember um, seeing it and I hadn't seen it yet. And I had all these people with me and I was just like, at first I was like, man, fuck, I hope that these people aren't pissed at me because it's kind of like my style movie. It's kind of slow. And and then I don't... It's a three hour long German movie. That's right. Yeah. I could see some Mm -hmm. of them like looking over at me like during the fucking thing and just being like, fuck, man. (laughs) You really owe me for my birthday this year. They were looking at yeah, me and saying, "You're that. lucky it's your birthday." Yeah. But that first, like <laughs> that first kind of big turn where you know the father. I mean, we'll get to this, but like that first mm-hmm. big laugh, it felt like everybody relaxed into their seats. And yeah, it's a long movie for sure. But I just remember like that first watch, watching it all the way through in a theater with probably like a half packed room like it wasn't fully packed it was just a random like january night man i just remember walking out of there like people were fucking they felt it felt like uh you had just been to like a good concert you know people were kind of yeah. electric after it and you've been on a journey together right yeah that was my experience thank you guys for asking <laughs> Did you watch again for this? Yes, and I watched you it a last year experience. on my birthday as mm-hmm. well. Oh, okay. So it's a birthday tradition now. It is. <laughs> it is. Hell yeah. Um, okay, am I allowed to move forward now? You are, officially. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> all right, so this is a German movie. So cast for this is all basically German people who I didn't really recognize for anything. The guy who plays Hennenberg, Michael Wittenborn, was just in that movie All Quiet on the Western Front, mm. which I did not watch. But that's a big movie that maybe some people have seen. I didn't see that. I didn't see it. Critic scores, we got 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. 67% of Google users gave this a thumbs up. So that's, you know, not as good. Um, but a 3.8 on Letterbox. So that's a decent. Can I have one of you read a little summary? I got one in the chat. Al, you're the actor, so you have to. <laughs> do you want me to do this in the uh, Jerry as. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as George playing Kramer? Mm-hmm. Okay. A practical joking father. <laughs> A practical joking father (laughs) tries to reconnect with his hardworking daughter by creating an outrageous alter ego and posing as her CEO's life coach. Excellent. (laughs) So that's what the movie's about. Now we can get into it. This is about a three hour movie, as we said, it's quite long. But I think every hour of the movie is kind of a different part of the story. So this first part, this first hour is sort of the setup of the father, how he lives and the initial entrance of the daughter and the conflict Mm -hmm. so setting up daddy (laughs) yeah the beginning is also super comedy heavy so so funny yeah big huge jokes laugh out loud moments when we meet him he's doing a prank this is basically the first thing that happens in the movie is him doing a prank Mm -hmm. Uh, a really good prank too uh, where he has a, a double persona and pranks a package delivery man when he shows up to the door with these big teeth on sunglasses a robe holding an open banana and having a single handcuff on having introduced himself as a different guy as a criminal who has just gotten out of prison for mailing bombs what a great throw into this movie (laughs) yeah he does eventually reveal his identity to the post guy uh, which he does often throughout the movie as he continues his pranks because he is a regular prankster Mm -hmm. but he's not rude you know he's an honest man Mm -hmm. uh, and you got to respect that yeah but that's interesting (laughs) I mean not to jump too far ahead but you're right like he he seems to kind of always reveal that it was just a lighthearted prank until he doesn't you know yeah later in the film his kind of pranking becomes maybe a bit he's more trying of a persona out a character. Yeah, yeah he's trying out a character but it becomes almost like a borat thing where he would never break mm-hmm. uh because if he were to break and we'll get to this 
But if mm-hmm. he were to break, then that would mean the con- that would mean he really would fuck over the confidence or the trust of his daughter, which he already is kind of yeah. doing uh, to an extent. But uh, I think he's really like not able to come off the bit at some point. You know, he's locked into yeah. it. He commits to the bit. He commits to the bit. And you had to respect that, too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the first part is just all around him. He's a pretty jovial guy. He takes care of his mom. He's a sweetie. He has a blind dog. He's got a big heart. He's a piano teacher. The next best uh, laugh out loud moment early in the film is that school performance mm-hmm. where he gets done up in corpse paint for the school performance right. and then shows up with all either like seventh graders or something. Yeah. All in corpse paint yeah. to sing a song to a teacher who's retiring, um, <laughs> singing that their dead saddie's leaving. Just so funny. I almost wonder, I mean, this is not really a comedy. The beginning is so funny, but I would love to see what she could do with an actual comedy because I think some of the stuff in here is so fucking funny. Well, what do you mean by an actual comedy? Well, it's not just straight comedy. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like funny stuff happens, but it's not really a comedy. Yeah. I don't think. What do you think? Why, think why would you challenge me? Hmm? You would, think it's a comedy? I think it's I think it's a comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know what you mean by that, that there's maybe yeah. as many gags or setups or sort of set up punchline kind of things. Mm-hmm. But I think that in a, in a maybe a strict sense that there's a kind of continuity at the end, right? Like if yeah. a t- tragedy ends with everybody dead at the end of the thing or some sort of thing, <laughs> so the case is solved or something. This is a comedy where like two people that were kind of apart have come together. Mm-hmm. I mean it in a maybe more like traditional sense. So it's not like a, a Hollywood comedy. Like it's not like, you know, Dumb and Dumber, but it's its roots are comedy. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. a dark, It has a darkness to it, but like a, a real, you know, comedic backbone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Adam? Do you think it's a comedy? No, I agree. I, I, I agree with, with you. And I also uh, totally understand what you're saying, Kayla. I think that... Um, you both sides. You're a centrist. I'm a centrist. I'm a centrist mm-hmm. in Hell all yeah. things, period. I want everybody to <laughs> like me. I don't want to say anything <laughs> controversial. No, but I, I, I think that that's like an interesting thing to talk about is like, what is a comedy? Because I think that mm-hmm. we in America, like... Uh, have a rich tradition of great comedies. There's great comic directors from the beginning of cinema here in the States. Uh, Michael and I are both big Buster Keaton fans. You know, there's a ton of like titans of comedy that probably would do things a lot different than the German sensibility or Marinata's Mm -hmm. sensibility. But I do think that the bones of everything that she's doing, even though she seems to kind of be from this Berlin school of movie making where things are a bit more centered on drama... I think she's using that to kind of create this, uh, this like stop and start or this kind of high and low rhythm. And I think that that's what makes the jokes that are so memorable or the, the comedic moments that are so memorable as strong as they are because you have the kind of uncertainty that leads you to that. It's not like a Judd Apatow film where you know somebody's going to say a quippy thing and then somebody's going to get the thing ripped off of their titties and then. <laughs> Like you're just laughing, you know, you're Mm -hmm. you're expected to be laughing the whole time. Mm -hmm. So definitely it is a drama that's kind of like moonlighting as a comedy. But I think comedy is always the tool to create the drama. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think that the drama and the comedy aspects are like really working perfectly in this movie together. Yeah. And you were mentioning Chris's work, Chris Borgley's work. And I think that that's Mm -hmm. a similar thing. Like maybe there's a bit Mm -hmm. more of a, a wink sometimes when you're watching some of his short stuff. But I think that he's very also, you know, maybe it's a Norwegian sensibility that he's drawing from, but there is this kind of like uh, anticipatory element to the drama that isn't really giving away where it's going. So the jokes kind of happen in a surprising way. Yeah. And that's what I think Tony Erdman is great at, you know, surprising you with the comedy and not leading with it necessarily. Yeah. You do never know what's coming next, but you know, something's always coming. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You're never aware in this entire film, I think what's coming next (laughs) yeah exactly that's my favorite and that's what you know that's what i like about chris's work too is Mm -hmm. it's always so unexpected that's uh probably my top most respected quality in any film because i watch so many yeah movies i'm i'm you know i'm a huge movie guy uh and especially shorts if you're showing me something that i don't already know what's coming that's kind of it's a blessing i've seen so many of these things i know how they go (laughs) right and don't you feel cheated by that like i do i just i don't want to watch 
I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm just like fussy about the things that I like to watch and the things I don't. I feel like the and I'm, you gave like a run of show of what we're going to talk about. And I'm skipping all over the place, but I feel like the stuff You're that okay. I'm watching in just like my the time that I'm watching stuff is either like kind of I don't know. Like it's either like going to be like a highly esteemed kind of cinematic experience that has been vetted by like the world cinema stage at some point or it's dumb as fuck it's like 90 day fiance <laughs> and love is blind you know uh-huh. <laughs> um but that in between shit and I, i'm not gonna call names but there's a certain network right now that michael knows who i'm talking about there's a certain network putting out comedies and shows that feel so doctored and and noted by the producers and the executives at that company that there's just nothing to draw from it nothing you can tell mm-hmm. that they just fucking they took it to so many test screenings and did so many like notes of audiences and tried to hit every note that they could and it's mm-hmm. just left void of any real life mm-hmm. to it you know and i i i just I don't have time for that, you know? I don't have time for that in my life right now. So when I'm starting to feel that, when I'm watching something, I just tune out, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think Tony Erdman's like the perfect example of something that's like going back and forth like that, Mm -hmm. where you're you're on this roller coaster and it has those elements of drama, it has those elements of comedy. It's sort of blurred and like distant. I sort of forget I'm watching anything that's a genre. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's this guy putting on a bunch of different masks I thought that was a really interesting thing too. Like right at the beginning, he kind of becomes Tony Erdman. Mm-hmm. Like he calls his brother's name as Tony. That's like at that very beginning scene. And then the next scene, he puts on this makeup and he kind of refuses to take it off. And then by the end, everybody's, you know, not to skip too far ahead, but there's a, a revealing scene, right? And then he's in this like crazy costume by the mm-hmm. end. So it's like, you never know what he's going to do. And he can do that because he set up the rules of this story or she's right, set up the rules of the story that we can go anywhere and he can come in anywhere and be anything. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. it's a magical thing. And I, it is. Yeah, we're not going to see that in a sort of Hollywood movie necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like they, she has the freedom to sort of explore and expand. It's great. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Refreshing. And it keeps you on the lookout at all times for where he's going to be popping up and what he's going to, what kind of hijinks he's going to be up to. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's just so fun. So this guy is also based on the director's real dad, who was also a prankster and whom she gave a set of Austin Powers teeth <laughs> to when she was in her early 20s. Genius. And he always used the teeth as a prank too and was also a music teacher. Mm -hmm. But she said that that was his favorite joke was to use the teeth. He would use them before going to the dentists or when he was about to complain about food at a restaurant or if he had something really serious to say, he'd put in the teeth um, and had a really good sense of humor. So those aspects of this guy are based on her real dad, which I think is really sweet. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I've heard her talking about how her family, her father included, or her father chiefly kind of deal with, yeah, like the tensions of life with comedy. You just gave good examples of how he does that. But I I don't know. Do y'all have family members like that? I would say my dad was kind of a goofball. Yeah. But I haven't known him in a long time. But yeah, he was a goofer. Yeah. For sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I feel like I, I feel like down south, we know about 20 people like this. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> and like both sides. It's Yeah. I think there's always that uncle. There's always my dad's a goofball. Like my grandfather, I just remember a lot of that. You just sort of, you're telling stories, you're doing characters, you're doing bits all the time. Mm -hmm. It's great that she sort of built this whole story out of like these weird teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) a really poignant like kind of heartwarming story at the end i mean it's it takes you in a lot of different directions and it's tough but like it's really just these goofy teeth like sometimes that's enough mm-hmm. thing to, propel you to into- see to oh. see a, an isolated pair of austin powers teeth mm. and and to use those teeth to weave such a like dramatic and and emotionally powerful story and journey for two characters mm-hmm. I, I mean what a blessing of a brain to have to do that <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> that Great rocks. Typical number to boot i mean yeah there's mm-hmm. some really funny funny moments mm-hmm. real great slapstick a lot of misdirection you know like we've already been saying but you know some committed ass performances like yeah. dude is is great obviously like he stars this thing you know it's sort of mm-hmm. ship. but she's an amazing counterpoint and like how she reacts to him mm. is a whole lot of the movie too absolutely and, like, yeah a lot of that humor is like brought out through how she's fumbling through 
his antics. It's mm -hmm. really like it's a it's a sophisticated thing. Really funny. It's a good like mm -hmm. straight line wavy line kind of type of comedy that they're doing, where he's mostly the wavy line and she's left to kind of deal with it. And then there's a flip at some point where she becomes kind of right. the unpredictable character. She kind of takes on the. Yeah the persona of her father at some point. I think at first his silliness is really challenging to her. It throws her off balance. That's right. She doesn't know how to react to it. It sort of creates like an inner turmoil. She's like, I don't know. She doesn't know how to react to it. And it's upsetting to her life. She starts making mistakes. She hurts her toe. Mm. She like, you know, uh, misses a meeting. She like starts fucking stuff up because she's flustered by mm -hmm. <laughs> his waviness. I yeah. Guess. And when his you're goofiness. not in a place mm -hmm. where you're ready to receive your family member being that person, it's hell. I remember mm -hmm. being in the fifth grade and my school was like fifth to eighth grade. So I was the young guy and I was on the school bus in the fifth grade, first day of school. And there were all these fucking older kids and my house was like one of the first drops. So the kid, the school bus was packed and we go down this hill to where my house is. And I'm just kind of sitting there and someone's like, whose dad is that? And I look up and I see my dad with like his big ass fucking VHS camera on his shoulder and he's dancing like in the front yard. <laughs> and he walks up to the door of the bus filming me. And I was just like, I couldn't believe that this was happening. And the kids on my bus, like some of them were like, that's funny. And some of them were like, man, who the fuck is this white ass <laughs> fucking bald dad? And I just, I, I got off the bus and the bus left and the kids were just like making fun of me. And I cried and I was like, dad, why would you ruin my life like this? Why would you do that? And uh -huh. I think that's a lot how, that's how Inez feels a lot yeah. of the time in the movie, right? Yeah. And what did your dad say at that time? Do you remember? Yeah, he just laughed it off. He was like, <laughs> stop being a pussy, dude. Like, this is funny. I feel like your dad is a very Erdman dad. There's a lot of, like, coach yeah. kind of internet stuff that had a lot of this in, like, mm -hmm. you know, youth minister kind yeah. of that. What is your dad? How does he order from a restaurant? What's his, like, go-to bet? My dad, my dad will, at any restaurant, at any fucking restaurant you go to, the waiter will come around and get to my dad, and my dad will be looking at the menu, and he'll go, um, okay, great. I think, uh, I think I'm just gonna have the double chubby chuck with the Mexicali chili bar. <laughs> And then the waiter will go like, uh, sir, we don't have that. And he'll go, okay, no worries. I'll just take the alligator snout sandwich. <laughs> and that waiter's like, <laughs> we don't have that. And then my dad will be like, oh, okay, I'll just have the steak, you know, or whatever. Like, <laughs> And nobody really thinks it's funny. Like every now and then a waiter yeah. will like give him a little wink and a nod. But for the most part, the waiter is like, okay, this fucking guy, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. But My dad connects. has a lot of Tony Erdman in him, for sure. I think mm -hmm. all dads do, maybe. He's a very... Yeah. In, in, in both senses. He's also, like, you know, not a great father at times, too, right? My it's dad like, or Tony Erdman? No, no, no. Tony Erdman. <laughs> your dad. Yeah, we're like, roasting your dad. We're, like, roasting Live my dad. Air. He's, like, listening yeah, yeah. to this at work, and he's like, what the fuck, Alex? <laughs> I did a good job raising you, man. <laughs> no, I just had a kid, Kayla, and he's 10 mm -hmm. months old, and... Already, I'm looking for ways to zorn his ass. I'm looking for ways to just, like, <laughs> troll him. It's, there's something very lovely and demented about the love that I have for him, and I want it to come across in the comedy. You want to fuck him up a little bit, yeah. but not too much. Yeah, I want to yeah. fuck him up a good bit. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to start walking Testing, pretty soon. Where's the line? He's going to start yeah. walking pretty soon. And immediately I'm going to start just shoop, shucking Sticking him. Sticking your foot out. Yeah, so that he can trip him. him. <laughs> this, will make him a, this will make him a strong human, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where were we? <laughs> we weren't kind of really anywhere. We were sort of atmospheric on this. Yeah. Um, okay. So we introduced the dad's character. We sort of talked about the daughter's character, but we haven't really like introduced her. So mm -hmm. she's like a top doggy businesswoman mm -hmm. consultant, and she's so deadpan, pretty much the antithesis to her dad. So serious, cannot find joy, depressing. <laughs> yeah. Even. I guess we're introduced to her at an early birthday party for her, but we're not really introduced to her. Like, she's really not there that long. She's kind of on the phone and then leaves. Mm -hmm. So 
he spontaneously flies to Romania to surprise her mm-hmm. and be silly, but she she doesn't give him anything. Right. And I think once we start to see him interact with her world, that beginning silliness, that over the top LOL silliness that was happening at the beginning becomes really important as a contrast marker mm-hmm. to how his humor is received in Romania in the presence of his daughter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And what does she do? Like, I'm, I'm, I mean, she works for like a corporation and she's on a work trip in Romania, but what is mm-hmm. her, like, what is their line of work? She's a consultant for an oil company. An oil yeah. company, that's right. But she's just a consultant. She, she technically works for a consulting company, mm-hmm. which is like, these type of companies people hire to make terrible business decisions for them so that they don't have to take the heat for it, which is what she's doing. Right, right. So she's in the process of, with this oil company, coming up with a strategy to outsource all of their labor, Mm -hmm. which means that basically all of their employees are going to be fired or the majority are going to be fired. All the working class Mm -hmm. uh, section of their uh, employment is going to be fired in favor of outsourcing to save money. So she's remember, kind of a demon. Yeah, yeah. Do y'all remember that movie, uh, the Jason Reitman movie, Up in the Air, with George Clooney? No. Oh, it's about a guy that has to fire people. Yeah, that's his whole job yeah. is he, he gets hired to come into these companies and fire them, mm. which I always thought was an interesting job. And I met someone not long ago who had just quit a job where that was what they were doing. And they were the nicest people like so sweet and their job was really Mm. to go in and fire people that had been working like their whole careers at these companies because those companies were either downsizing or outsourcing for whatever reasons right but they would hire this guy to come in and do the head chopping and it just sounds so brutal so intense yeah that sounds terrible i wouldn't want to do that no (laughs) that fucking sucks Uh -uh. (laughs) that sounds terrible though i wouldn't do it yeah it sounds tough sounds tough whether you were like a very chipper person or kind of a hard ass like mean person it sounds like a hard job yeah so that's what she's doing essentially but she doesn't seem phased by it at all Uh -uh. throughout the movie we see more and more instances of her kind of owning her position in this and sometimes being sort of on the front lines of her position in this yeah and never really being emotionally affected by it no because i think she can see the value in being the hardest of all of her colleagues right she thinks that that's going to help her career have a tipping point and like she'll get promoted or get a better job and i think that yeah which is interesting because that whole corporate structure of of dealing with people can be so inhumane and it's funny that they are yeah. there are so many careers within that sort of section of it to support that you know so then the, you have to imagine there are people like Inez or Inez who yeah not only do that they're not like getting off on it necessarily but they're not phased by it because they're about survival they're about growth for themselves more than anything and they're also getting paid hella money to be evil that's it <laughs> so it's almost like a character so... she's playing in her own life you know yeah The rest of their week together at this initial time Mm -hmm. is, yeah, just pretty heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Just him trying to be goofy, trying to cheer her up and her really not giving him anything. And every time he tries to be funny in this section, it comes out kind of sad Mm -hmm. (laughs) because nobody's giving him anything. He just kind of seems like so out of place and like the air has been sucked out of the room, you know? And it is sad. It's like... um... (sighs) I don't know. It's like you you kind of are watching her continually like deny the father and not give him an inch ever. And he keeps trying. And at some point you just feel bad for him. And yeah, I start to think about like dark shit in my life, like (laughs) the people that died that I didn't say goodbye to, you know, just whatever. (laughs) Like. But going back to the beginning of this conversation, <laughs> that's why I think that the comedy yeah. is so strong, right? Because there's there, it's not just again like not dogging Judd Apatow, but mm-hmm. there's not that breadth of life in a Judd Apatow film necessarily. I mean, maybe there is, but it feels more like a plot point rather than something mm-hmm. that's kind of naturalistic and organic to the character's life. And you have to sit through these moments to get to the funny stuff. Yeah, in Tony Erdman. 
And the comedy in this part is not used mm-mm. for comedy. Mm-mm. It's used to create emotional response, uh, mm-hmm. to create sadness, even mm-hmm. to create embarrassment mm-hmm. and empathy. Um, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think the end of like that that first section, it's like you really feel a lot of to get the humor. You have to sort of go through the pain and really mm-hmm. feel it. He's he's lost his dog. His job's kind of over. Everybody, his job sort of, he, he, you know, he puts his foot in his mouth and does like a weird death themed retirement mm-hmm. sing along. <laughs> like, what the fuck is that for? Like, mm-hmm. it's just a fact, like nobody gets it. Nobody cares about his gags and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, he meets the daughter. She's striving at the ex wife's house, the mom's house. Mm-hmm. And they're very put together. And he then he does this kind of weird thing and goes to see her and they have this tearful goodbye. And like mm. one kind of movie could end right there. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. tearful goodbye and this pain. And the next scene is the restaurant scene where she's going, I can't believe my dad came down here. And he's like right behind her. You know, it's like the funniest next beat is like right there. Mm-hmm. But you got he, we have to go all the way down to the depths of the, the pain to get mm-hmm. that like ascended comedy moment. It hurts so much. You know, uh-huh. he's all in. It's great. Yeah. And I think that the end of or close to the end of that first section where they're like at a spa or something and he asks her basically what makes her happy or what's Mm -hmm. what's giving her life. Um, I think that that even though she doesn't really answer and she kind of dodges, I think that's sort of the start of her like existential Mm -hmm. journey Mm -hmm. throughout the movie and him being there while she's grouchy the whole time about everything. She can't be happy about any single thing. Um, I think kind of forces her to become aware of that aspect of herself, of that she's always grouchy, of that she's never laughing. She's also somewhat forced. Oh, not to cut you off. Caleb. No, go on. Well, she's also sort of forced to reckon with like the fact that a lot of her colleagues really fuck with the dad. They love him. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. in a way that they don't love her, no matter how good she is at her job, no matter how hardcore she can be like they're they're not as attracted to her as they are the father. Right. So there's Mm -hmm. some moment. I think that that moment where she starts to have this somewhat existential conversation within herself is kind of forced upon her also from that same sense of survival where it's like, well, shit. Mm -hmm. My boss loves my dad or loves Tony Erdman. Yeah. What am I missing out here? And how can I play on that to kind of help myself? Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of like fear in her grows its own legs and creates something new inside of her, like a new thought, a new line of thinking about yeah everything with her dad sure yeah and in those moments too there is a lot of sexism at play her boss just being like "Uh, go off and do shopping with my wife like i'm not really interested in your business proposal (laughs) right (laughs) that's interesting Mm -hmm. okay so then one hour mark yeah we hit this start of this sort of middle section where we're joining her on her journey we've kind of dad's gone quote unquote left town and we're with her on her section yeah her and the girlies are out complaining about their quote-unquote terrible weekends which were like my loving dad came to visit me that was weird Mm. um i went to naples and it sucked right Uh, (laughs) and he does a great reveal spinning around in the wig and the teeth and introducing himself as the titular tony erdman Yep. He acts like a total stranger. This is his new persona, the Tony persona. And she does not spill the beans on his character, even though she could. Why do we think that is? Because she could play off of him, like you said? Because she could use his charisma to gain points within her peer group? I mean, I don't think it's that calculated at that point. I think Mm -hmm. it's a a fear, right? Like, okay, if I let on to the fact that this is my dad, then the whole house of cards that she's building will crumble. I don't. They're going to think I'm silly? Yeah, or they're going to just like take, you know, they're going to think my dad and my whole family are like a joke. And I'm, mm. you know, she's like positioned herself in this way that's very serious and I'm not a joke and I'm, I'm a serious person and, and worker in this company. And I think that mm. if she let the cat out of the bag that, oh, that guy that just turned around and introduced him as, himself as Tony Erdman with the teeth and the wig is my dad, I think she would forfeit a lot of the work that she had been doing. So it's easier for her to just Mm. kind of go with it and hope that it will end. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's like, I think that's the moment that like Tony is born, you know, he's dealing with like, okay, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? 
-hmm. It's also, yeah, it's such a funny like world they're in. Romania, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's kind of this like post Cold War thing. And where is Romania? No one can say. We yeah, don't know. It's, it's like, and there's been, you know, a lot of governmental changes. There's a lot of like different, you know, money coming in and all this stuff. But I love the the world of like business cards and like I know this guy and I'm a life coach and I'm a consultant. They're not like real jobs. Yeah. They're just sort of this like nebulous power thing. And the mm -hmm. one thing that she doesn't, she's very good at it, very like striver. And the one thing she doesn't have is she's not a human being. Mm -hmm. And then Tony comes along and he's sort of making connections with actual human beings. It's like yeah. the one thing that she can't do. Right. And then she's got to sort of draft off of him to try and get it positioned with the boss and so on. And then I think that my favorite part of that scene is when they sit down to have the meal finally. And he's behind them. Yeah. Yeah. Still having, yeah. Scooting. He sco loudly scoots the table <laughs> forward in the background, though. Uh huh. And having him, he kind of, this continues with him, uh, that he's always like popping up somewhere in the background. You don't know when you're going to see him, but he's doing something really funny off screen or side screen in the background. That rocks. It just keeps you looking out, you know, keeps you on your toes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he's always out there seeking the joke, even when no one's paying attention to him. When no one's looking, mm -hmm. he he bought a Hummer limo for what reason? <laughs> Nobody saw it. It was just him out there, you know? <laughs> so he's fully committing to the bit, yeah. uh, which, as we said, we respect. Whether or not it works, whether or not anyone's paying attention, uh, he's never dissuaded from being silly. And I think that rocks. Right. And sometimes you're like, also... How long has he waited for someone to show up and like see him there? You know, how long mm -hmm. was he on that roof before mm -hmm. she came up to like at random kind of to talk with her coworker? You know, was he just up there like hoping she might come that way? <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Uh, it's like, yeah, his commitment to the bit is kind of unparalleled. Like, yeah, yeah, you're mentioning all these kind of gags that he tries out that don't even get seen by anyone. Yeah. There's a patience to it. You know, mm -hmm. and you don't really know his end game either because you're like, true, right? Yeah. This, the beginning, like that, he's sick, he has like a heart monitor, he's sort of taking pills. You're like, okay, is this some like crazy spend all my money on my like last day of living or something? Or is, mm -hmm. is this an elaborate prank? This is like something that he does. Like, what's his angle here exactly? Like, is he trying to humiliate her? Like, it really sometimes it feels weirdly mean spirited, like he's trying to get it, mm -hmm. but then other times it's like, completely just for a gag for a goof mm -hmm. you know yeah that's great to just like try and be around her you know yeah he's testing her sometimes he's testing her he's provoking her a little bit for sure but i think ultimately with good intention like he just wants to crack her he wants her to crack and be silly and have fun and experience joy and he doesn't think she's getting that so it's like what do I have to do mm -hmm. to make you be happy, to make you have joy, and frankly, to make you smile? Because uh, women, let me tell you, they look a little better when they're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just not getting it out of her. <laughs> Wait, you he's think you think women look better when they're? Let's 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 camp out on that for a sec. <laughs> But he can't get it out of her. Yeah. And so and so he gets rude, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all it's ultimately he's got, you know, love in his heart and he's just trying to get his little girly back. Right. But she ain't having it really. Right. Not at this point in time. Right. Yeah. Right. Which I think is like admirable for a parent like I uh... To care that much? Yeah, to go yeah. through I, all that? No, yeah. seriously. I think that I've seen like a pattern with parents uh, of friends and whatever. Like not all parents, of course, but I have noticed like mm -hmm. as we get older. Hashtag not all parents. Hashtag not all parents. Hashtag not me. <laughs> you, you kind of, I've kind of noticed that uh, as I've gotten older and friends have gotten older, like parents can sometimes have a short fuse where they're like, you know what? Fuck this. Like, I've given mm -hmm. you everything that I could, and now, like, just, you know, do your own fucking thing, because that's all you're going to do anyway, and what the fuck do I matter, and kind of this, like, wash your hands clean resolve about kids that become adults, so it's somewhat, like, admirable that he's really putting in the time and the money and mm -hmm. the commitment to the bit, you know, for all intents and purposes, so that he can just get some time with her and some like yeah. some attention from her in a way and they're blessed to be european where they get what six weeks of vacation a year so right. they have time to just be chilling six or plus i don't know um 
And they have time to just be chilling and goofing off with their daughter and spending time loving their family where (laughs) uh, not a lot of us get that time and opportunity. So he's a little blessed in that respect, too. Totally. Um, But he is also, you know, not only he's confronting her with his humor, um, etc. He's also being protective of her. Like he does Mm. insult her coworker who was being sexist Mm. to her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's also being protective dad. And I respect that too. Yeah. So what's next? She has some social scenarios that he is, well, he's only involved in one. But one is her sexual relations with her teammate, co-worker. which uh, just was a <laughs> her teammate coworker. Yeah. Just an interesting scene. She refuses to fuck for the, the Cliff's notes. She refuses to fuck, but she does make him come on a, a cookie or something, a little cake. Yeah. And eats it. So we get a little nasty. Yeah. But she's still denying herself joy in that way, right? Mm -hmm. She won't fuck. Right. Then secondly, she she calls up the girlies to go clubbing. Mm -hmm. And they get into some drugs. They do a little blow. And she's still sad there. She's still not having a good time in the club with her girlies, doing drugs and drinking, crying. Sitting there quietly crying mm-hmm. in the club. And who hasn't Dad been Dad doing there? gags. Dad's doing gags. Uh, yeah. You're yacked up on blow and, and Tito's. <laughs> and who hasn't been in the corner of the club crying a little bit? I'm watching Michael right now on the Zoom and he's going, he's just rifling through 30 scenarios where this has happened to him over the past couple of years. He's thinking about ripping up that Harry Potter book crying quietly <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> That's right. A lot of volumes of that book. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, thus far, every time we've seen her have the opportunity to be in a pleasurable experience, to let go, have fun, she does not take the opportunity or she sabotages it. She doesn't even earlier. She complained about the massage Mm -hmm. that she could have gotten. She leaves the massage. She won't give fuck. She cries at the club. When they were having her first birthday party at her mom's house, she was faking being on the phone to not be at the party. So right. it's like every every opportunity she could have had to experience joy, she's kind of denying herself that. Yeah, maybe that comes from this kind of persona that she has uh, at work, right? Like mm-hmm. maybe deep down she feels some guilt about it on, on like some deep level and this is the way it surfaces. That because she's kind of the exactor of pain to an extent – through her job, she can't allow herself to experience any pleasure or traditional yeah. pleasure. Or maybe she's sort of overcorrected in her effort. You know, as a woman, you got to be a little more stern to be taken seriously. And she's sort of overcorrected and now can never not be stern. Yeah. But nobody else is making her that way. It's just her. It's just an internal thing that maybe she starts to slowly realize. Mm. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's like the first time we see her is really interesting, too, and how she's perceived. Like her stepfather and her mom are sort of preppy and like upper middle class. And they're Mm -hmm. very proud of her. She's living and, you know, she's down in in Romania doing this. But soon she's going to go to Shanghai or she's off to some better job. And she's really killing it. Oh, she's so busy. And then just, you know, beat after beat, like you said, she just starts to unravel. Mm -hmm. And you start Mm -hmm. to see like, oh, none of this is what it seems to be and Mm -hmm. she kind of goes into this crisis and yeah it's i that's i haven't thought about it like her inability to feel joy Mm. uh, or pleasure until really that climactic end moment Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah it all comes out yeah yeah um i think the next big scene is them going to the oil site Mm -hmm. this is kind of a long and winding scene but a guy gets fired right there on the spot And I think this is just another like really in your face moment about how the dad is so emotionally affected by this one person getting laid off and she's not experiencing that emotion or any emotion really about it. Relief even, if anything, because that's just one less person she's going to have to fire later. Totally. (laughs) But I think that's a moment where you really see his view of her start to, I don't know if change is the right word, but... um, I don't think he was expecting that from her necessarily. He's come to a new realization. Right. And I think that like it's the first time maybe that he challenges her in a different way. Like I think up to that point, the challenge Mm -hmm. has been that he's kind of annoying and he should be avoided Mm -hmm. at all costs. Yeah. But this is the first time that he's kind of confronted her or just shown like 
not disdain, but just like some disappointment yeah, at her heartlessness. Mm-hmm. And maybe that starts to kick back on her for the first time in a way that his pranks could never, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It also feels like she's kind of calling his bluff a little bit. She's like, oh, you want to do this like Tony Erdman character thing? Like, mm. fine. You want to come to the parties where I am? You want to come to my office? All right, cool. Let's go to work with me. And you'll see yeah. what I do, which is laying people the fuck off. Right. And he did it accidentally because he's speaking English or German or something and they don't understand him and it's a miscommunication. And then there's this weird scene where he goes to use the bathroom at like a local guy's house, which is, mm. and kind of shares this joke about the tiger, like bite them on the, bite them on the ass or something. Mm-hmm. And he gives him apples. And he tries to give him money. It's just very like, the, you know, the perspective is switched a little bit. Like, oh, you think this is a joke, but this is really my life. And that's the first time he's really, even I guess gotten that close to her life maybe right yeah and it's maybe challenging to her to see him experience community bonding and compassion that she's not able to experience too Mm -hmm. yeah and like how she's how she perceives these like (laughs) these situations that he's I mean he's kind of trying to now then like pull the 180 I know we haven't gotten to the next scene yet but he's you know, goes to this woman that he met at the mm-hmm. got her card at the party, yeah. and offers her the apples that the local guy gave her as mm-hmm. a gift. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it really does turn into this. Like I think Al, we were talking about this before the thing. Like when it hits that the Whitney Houston scene, yeah, we're into like a whole different realm. Mm-hmm. And I think to me, like the movie is very good at setting up these characters, and they're really like deeply drawn, and there's like really great moments and like kind of painful things. But I feel like what really separates the wheat from the chaff on this movie is that last from like here on in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It becomes like next level kind of interesting move. Yeah. Like from, I mean, are we at the point where we're talking about the party where he says, uh, we'd like to sing for you? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It really feels like that's the first time she's given an inch. And she is a little bit backed into a corner because they're at this, <laughs> they're at, this other person's house that he met and it's a whole family gathering yeah. he kind of throws out we'll sing you a song as thanks or whatever <laughs> yeah. and she gets the whole family together everyone's settling in all eyes on them they really can't get out of this moment yeah. you know without seeming like a total ass yeah. and making an ass out of both of them in the process so mm-hmm. so yeah he plays he plays a little tune he's a piano teacher mm-hmm. so he knows how to play a little tune and uh, she sings that Whitney Houston song, Greatest Love of All. Right. And then she does the, uh, I mean, he does the intro like over and over until. Yeah, she yeah. come in. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And she does come in and she does do the number. Oh, she kills it. But kills she it. doesn't let that moment stay. She no. doesn't let that moment climax. She immediately leaves. takes off. She leaves yeah. as soon as the song is over. She jets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's sad about that. And he stays behind with the family to still get that community and familial sort of connection and also reveals his identity again because he's an honest man that's right i mean and and not to turn this to me and michael necessarily but i do think that like there's something interesting about a movie that does what you're talking about michael where it builds up to this point and the rest of the movie just kind of sails to me it really like is singing and i think that dog like does that a little bit uh I, I mean, we've we've kind of tested different edits of the movie as we were cutting it for the past couple of years and kind of seen what worked and what didn't. And I did a screening of the film before it's premiering this week, a few weeks back. And it's funny, like watching the film with an audience in a theater, I kind of see it in a new way uh, that's different than watching it on a projector at Michael's place or at my place with oh, a yeah. friend or on the edit system and i think that our movie does that a little bit like there's a moment in the film um and i think that from Don't there spoil it. yeah i think that from <laughs> there it just sort of like it starts to fall in a, in a rhythm that's i'm not comparing our movie to tony erdman but it has a similar like rhythm to it from a certain point on where it just feels like you've built it up to this point and now it's not necessarily like the falling action so to speak but it feels like it's kind of skiing down a slope to the end of the yeah. movie. And that's how Tony mm-hmm. Erdman feels. I really love that. I think that endings are hard. I don't know if we got a good ending or not. I'll let somebody else decide that. But I always appreciate when a movie doesn't trip up on itself. And yeah. this movie definitely does not. It builds on itself. 
to that moment of the Whitney Houston song and then kind of just like flies all the way to the last 30, 45 minutes of the film, right? Yeah. I was glued to the screen yeah. after this. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like these set pieces, I think like we talk about this a lot, like Ruben Oslin has these great set pieces, like mm. Square, you think about the end with the guy, like the oh, museum yeah. and stuff like these really great moments. And this is one of my favorite of all time is the Tony Erdman. Like, I, I think this is kind of like the end of Abbey Road. It's like a little medley of like a bunch of different scenes, like yeah. the Whitney Houston scene, you know, and in that, the very tail end of that, she, this, I guess this woman that the, of the family that's taken her in that's having the party. I guess it's an Easter party. I was thinking about that. Oh it's yeah. Just, oh yeah. Yeah. They're painting the eggs. It's like ostensibly why he comes. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's a conversation that he had with her. And she says something about, he's like, what is that? And he's like, oh, it's a mask. And, and that was right after he's like, I'm not really the ambassador to Germany, which is the story that he told her. Right. She's like, yeah, I know the ambassador to Germany. And that's like a little <laughs> seed that gets planted for the costume that he puts on. Yeah. There. So it's like almost like he kind of has like, uh, I think his name's Wilford, like his actual name or something, Winford. Uh, and Winford. Winford. It's Winford, yeah. Winford. Yeah. And then he becomes Tony Erdman. And then mm-hmm. by the time we see him at the birthday party, he's this hairy monster thing, whatever he is, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the birthday party is that third, like that third chunk. That's where we start. I think the big final chunk. I like that you said it's like a medley, Michael. That's so true. It's just like from that birthday party on, it's kind of just banger scene after banger scene, you know, the buildup yeah. is done and now we're just like clipping yeah and i don't know if you want to like present the birthday scene or not but i think there's a lot of mini scenes in it Uh like just the caterers coming in Uh and like Mm -hmm. start to see her sort of psychologically like that i love that so those sort of like cold moments in these kinds of comedies where almost that's funny to me in a weird way just how basic it's like she takes her taking the sauces out of the refrigerator Mm -hmm. and putting them over on the table where the like you know, pigs in a blanket are, and then switching the, like getting the sign wrong and like mm. switching it around, like which mm-hmm. loss is which. There's just like these really subtle things and you don't really know where this is going, but she's presented everything just perfectly and she's just going to lose it. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. It's an insane build. So yeah, we've had the first section being the dad's sort of section, the middle section being the daughter's section, and then this third section being like both of them sort of breaking down and reassembling together, her especially breaking down. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that huge build up to her birthday party of all those little moments that you said definitely like increases the payoff of everything else that comes after it like she kind of sabotages her whole thing because she wears an outfit she decides last minute to change the outfit she can't get it on or off she's struggling someone's at the door yada 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 she just answers the door naked yeah (laughs) <laughs> and we turn this into a naked party. At first, you're like, okay, well, you know, this woman's here. Like, you know, it's girly time. Like, okay, I'll help you pick out an outfit. It'll be fine. We can save this. But uh, she does not allow it to be saved. Uh-uh. Um, and and she commits to the bit, you know, in, in her father's own way. <laughs> yes. Um, she's been shown how. So... Yeah, she goes full naked and she then encourages everyone else who's going to come in to be naked. Well, wait, does she encourage? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember. Does she encourage it or does she just come out and the other person is just naked? No, no. It's like it kind of has these like beats within it, too, because it's like Mm -hmm. at first, like you said, like she tries this dress on. The the shoes are wrong. She goes back in to sort of try to find something else. She can't find anything. And then, then it's just a long like. Ch- like Charlie Chaplin just getting her dress off. Yeah. Like, and, she and can't get her- it off or on. So either way, she's kind of fucked. Yeah, 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 yeah. The zipper is stuck. She can't, it's too, it's a tight little number, you know, these cute little numbers the ladies have. Uh, and so she can't get it up or down. And she's stuck in it. Then she finally gets it off. Now we don't want to go back into that thing. What do we do? The buzzer's going off. It's, yeah, it's a long, it's a long moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is mm-hmm. a moment, but it, yeah, it's very long and uh, incredible build yeah yeah and she kind of makes two choices one is to like go topless to the door yeah then once her colleague is in she sort of hasn't figured out what's going on is has she just forgotten that she's topless is she is it doing something whatever then 
she kind of makes the decision and takes her underwear off. She doubles down. Yeah. Doubles yeah, down. yeah, she doubles down. Yeah. And from that point on, the next person who comes to the door, she says, this is a naked party. I've decided it's a naked party. You got to be naked to come in here. Right, right, right. And that's when she kind of, she kicks the other lady out for not being naked. <laughs> <laughs> the other lady's like, no, I'm respectable. But I think at first, this is a move right. to like distance herself from everyone she just doesn't she's done with it all yeah everybody go away nobody's gonna come in my house naked what are they crazy so she does it initially to get everyone to go away because they're not gonna break like she's breaking they are also like these hard ass like uptight people Mm -hmm. so she does like kick everyone out and then just lay on the bed for a moment until her assistant shows up supportive girly and also naked Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then another person shows up also naked so you know she finds community even though (sighs) she's let go she finally has let go and people were there to catch her when she thought they wouldn't be you know yeah um so that's kind of special but also yeah hairy monster shows up to the door yeah it's it's hard to kind of talk about it's almost like talking about food you know what i mean like we can talk about how it tastes but when you watch the way that this film or the way that specifically this scene plays out yeah it's pretty like white knuckle type shit (laughs) because yeah. <laughs> it's way past the like, oh, I didn't expect that. It's building on. I lost all sense of time and space. Like right. I was glued into this movie. Yeah, for right. sure. Right. So then like after all of this naked business happens, then you just mentioned, <laughs> you know, her father shows up in this suit at the door, right? No one knows it's her father at first. Right. Yeah. It's right. just like a scary, it's a it's a kukeri, Bulgarian monster, but she, he shows up in this kukeri outfit that he found at the other lady's house, um, which is like a tall, like the head is really tall. It's yeah. a large costume. It's very hairy. It's made out of goat hair, apparently, and smelled terrible. Wow. Just a little fun fact. It's a stuntman in the costume the whole time, except for when you see his actual head. Okay. Because it smelled so bad. He didn't want to be in there. So. <laughs> it also looks like really bulky and hard to walk around and sure know. yeah it's big it's very it's big. big it is kind of alarming but i think its size is really um it's striking on screen like yeah. if he just showed up in any like random i don't know horsey outfit or something it wouldn't be as much of a moment but he shows up as this large like imposing monster almost like dr seuss looking thing creature you know it's like sesame street on acid you know it's like furry and tall dr seuss Seuss. there you go (laughs) that is sesame street on acid (laughs) that's true and it must be like nine feet tall I mean, that's how it's, tall it's it very looks. tall. Yeah. Yeah. And at first, nobody knows who's in it. I think eventually she deduces it's got to be her dad, obviously. But they're all like a little scared. <laughs> it's so large. Yeah. he's. They're yeah. walking through the park. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or the he, he the boss finally comes. That's the end beat of yeah. the scene. Mm-hmm. He, he decides, well, I love what the, uh, the assistant comes in and says she had, Inez, whatever, the main character kind of puts a robe on. She's uh-huh. sort of given up on the nudity thing. Mm-hmm. And the, the assistant comes to the door naked and she's like, oh, you don't have to be naked. She's like, no, I get it. It's a challenge. Yeah. Like she's so in <laughs> like corporate bullshit. <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah, that's no, I totally, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then the, the boss comes, he's officially like, ah, I guess we're doing this. And she's kind of given her points of like, you know, it's a real uh, team, team building. building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she, dude. And then he slowly creeps in and the dad in the huge 10 foot tall suit is right behind him. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. He, gives him, he gives him a fright. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, I feel like this whole movie is sort of based around some like uh, Austin Powers teeth mm-hmm. and crazy ass Bulgarian like hair suit yeah. that she just and it's like those two gags alone are like enough to build a whole character like if a guy's into those two things somehow yeah. <laughs> his thought process of being like i should just take the suit to the party right like that yeah. makes complete fucking sense uh-huh. and exactly like it's almost like he it's like purely his emotional self like mm-hmm. he is a big hairy monster goofy guy yeah and that's what he wants to be to the world that's sort of what Tony Erdman is. Mm-hmm. Is it's like funny, kind of surreal, scary, but kind of happy, fun thing. Yeah. It's a great image just for the whole movie. Yeah. Totally. He's in that suit, no words, just emotions. He doesn't say a damn thing. Mm-mm. But even so, um, so yeah, she follows him out of the party into a park. There's a gorgeous hug scene, mm. after which you can tell he's like crying yeah. <laughs> inside the suit, which is just 
good physical acting and still like emotionally impactful even though it's like such a silly moment like him being in this goofy huge suit in public there's like little kids trying to fuck with it and then she's like in a robe (laughs) naked underneath barefoot out in the middle Mm -hmm. of the city um chasing him around to give him a hug and it is kind of like children's storybook almost right and it is emotional like you're saying and i think Mm -hmm. that going back to the beginning of this conversation maybe that's why it's not so explicitly a comedy in your mind because like comedy the way that it's traditionally done doesn't really deal with emotion in that way like if they deal with emotion for instance in like a ben stiller movie or a, a comedy like someone has died or you know it's very like big Big yeah. brushstroke type drama. I just think of it as, yeah, a little more complex than like a standard comedy, I guess. And like, it is. And that the comedy that's in it isn't always, doesn't always serve the purpose of a laugh. And totally. it often actually doesn't serve, like it opposite of serves the purpose of a laugh. It serves the purpose of creating emotional complexity mm. um, or, you know, depth that's right yeah not it doesn't serve the purpose of comedy do you know what i mean totally so that (laughs) hug that hug as a standalone scene would be so different if it didn't have everything that came before it and you're right like he's crying you know under the mask they're hugging yeah i don't know there's something really powerful about that moment it's super powerful yeah Yeah, but i also yeah i also think it's really funny too it is like (laughs) it's it's, if you take the elements they are funny (laughs) yeah it's it's a great goofy moment that seems completely absurd i mean if you were to stumble upon this big hairy monster hugging someone in the middle of a park yeah hilarious yeah i also think it kind of reminds me of like kiristami movies those like you know kids movies where it's like a guy behind the like carrying a bunch of sticks and it seems like a monster but then it's real right yeah that childlike wonder but like reality Mm -hmm. too Mm -hmm. and then it's served up with all this deep emotional stuff right Mm -hmm. yeah it's got a a good like world view like a real wholesome world view for Mm -hmm. sure maybe when the moment when she's finding her own childlike wonder in this scene too she she's finally cracked (laughs) so yeah that's a gorgeous scene they do kind of like a death fake out for the daddy right there too Mm -hmm. i don't know that's probably i didn't need that I don't think. Um, mm. That's really the only thing I think I would say that to in this film. I didn't need that. Just felt like it was <laughs> a little much for you? Well, I'm just like, why? What, like, what was the point of that? Yeah, mm. I thought similar, like when he's laying down and his chest is sort of going up and down. And you're like, yeah. Oh, the- mm. I kind of liked it because I thought yeah. that it was kind of like building on the issues that they set up at the very beginning, that he has these heart problems. And, you know, I think that it's playing on – uh my kind of expectations for the movie which are definitely coming from some sort of like learned traditionality right where i'm like well this was the climax they had their moment he's gonna die sort of some sort of shakespearean type of ending and that's not what happened so i hear i hear y'all and i i I know what you're saying but it works for me i i was kind of like playing around with the idea that he's dying and it was it like doubled down on that emotionality for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just find that to be kind of cheap, I think. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. That's my opinion. But that's really like the only thing that about this whole entire movie that I was like, I don't know about. Yeah. So if that is true of a three hour movie like that is, that's pretty good. You know, there's only one perfect three hour movie and that's James Cameron's Titanic. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> There's not one moment in that that's so false. True. Yeah. <laughs> Based on a true story. So That's say. right. Based on a damn true story. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so after this gorgeous emotional moment and the uh death fake out, they do go to a funeral for his mommy. Mm. This is basically like the the end scene of the movie where they have this sort of conversation about he was dwelling on their earlier conversation of what makes life worth living mm-hmm. about holding on to moments and not letting things pass you by because you're doing this and that and uh, she does the little goof she does the teeth and the hat so you know her goofy little ass is in there somewhere (laughs) that's right and it's a there's a reveal that she quit her job too so you know Mm -hmm. maybe she's gonna turn a new leaf uh we don't know really right but i think that that in scene really encapsulates kind of whatever the movie is trying to point to if it were doing it in a somewhat sentimental if we were talking about it in sentimental terms like yeah if there is some sort of like theme or message to take away from it it is this kind of this kind of meditation on like how what 
what makes don't our, lose the humor don't lose the humor and also don't be so busy and so tied up with who you think you are how you announce yourself at a dinner party with your mom and your stepdad that you forget that like life is happening all the time and your to-do list is not necessarily that like it's happening underneath you yeah i really like the way that they handle the very end frames too right like she's in the the teeth like mm-hmm. the dad is kind of having this somewhat philosophical moment where he's asking that like where does the time go basically and yeah. what do we do to kind of capture life uh and is it possible to even do that right and she doesn't really know how to respond to him in those terms but she's there emotionally and she mm-hmm. grabs the teeth out of his pocket and she puts them in her mouth and she kind of leans around the door and grabs this funny silly like hat and puts it on mm-hmm. And his first thought is like, let me get my camera Mm -hmm. because I want to, I want to like capture this. I want to like distill this moment in my mind and in my photos. And he, you know, he kind of just says like, hold it right there, you know, and he walks away and, and then she's just kind of like meddling and waiting for him. And that's the end frame. And then it goes into that beautiful cure song uh, for the credits. Yeah. Just a pretty, like, fucking good-ass ending to me. Yeah, you know? for sure. Had he come mm-hmm. out and taken the picture and it, like, ends on the flash, there's something cheap about that. There's something mm-hmm. about the waiting that we're ending on Yeah, that allows, like, for the movie to continue in my mind. And so you ask, like, maybe it, she quit her job and is she going to turn the, a new leaf? Like, I really don't care about her yeah. in that way. <laughs> you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, if she ends up being, you know, a nun, that's fine. If she goes full in and becomes her boss, like, that's fine, too. It's more about this kind of, like, concentration on that moment for me. Like, okay, he just asked this question, like, how do we kind of, how do we kind of, like, capture life as it's happening? What do we do to be present and not be so clouded by this to-do list that we all have? And yeah. uh, in that moment, the movie does just that. And in that ending frame, it does just that. And I think that yeah. that is like why this is somewhat of a, a brilliant movie because of those little choices, you know? Yeah. And she gets that moment to sit there with herself and not mm. be pulled out of it. She gets to sit there with herself being silly. <laughs> That's right. She's like yeah. locked into it. Mm-hmm. I read a review that talked about also throughout this movie that the director sort of forces you to constantly also be in the moment with this movie because of how the scenes are structured, um, which I thought was a really interesting analysis. Like because you can never predict um, how or when a scene is going to end in this film uh, or what will happen next. Like sometimes they keep going beyond where you could have thought like the oil field scene is a really good example because you know first of all this guy gets fired we could have ended there you know but then there's like the whole bathroom stuff then there's like the apples then you know it just keeps going and going and you are kind of living with them and forced to be sort of present in that way Mm. as well because you can't anticipate what's coming next in this i think that's really cool yeah the length definitely like contributes to that Because it's not very tidy, is it? Like it, it kind of lets those scenes go and go and go sometimes. And that's, that's, yeah. And that's interesting. You couldn't cut it down though. No, not really. And I think that was the kind of like, I remember when it played at Cannes and like people were talking about a three hour German comedy, like being the kind of toast of Cannes that year. And Mm -hmm. just that alone was like, wait, what? Like that sounds. Crazy, but you're right. When you watch it, when you actually watch it, you you know that she didn't do it for length's sake. Right. Like she wasn't doing it to make a three hour German comedy. Like there's something yeah. behind that kind of length and that shadow. There's nothing like self flagellating about no. it. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's all necessary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Michael, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's got some space, but it's not it's not a slow cinema kind of thing. True. I mean, it's, it still moves along and clips along, but yeah, each scene is like necessary and is really earned. I, I think like each one we touched upon, I don't think there's like, there's not a scene that just sort of skates through. You re- Like we were talking at the beginning, like you kind of got to take it piece by piece. Like mm. I think it's a movie that deserves to be watched on a big screen in a, in a theater, like having that proper experience, like experiencing that length because it's a difficult watch just on the couch, I think, mm-hmm. because there, there is a like a demand for that attention and focus that, you know, can be distracting for watching at home. But 
I, I really like the writing a lot. I think the performances are just totally like some of the best stuff. The performances are out of this world. Like we didn't yeah. really talk about the actors yeah. specifically, but like the two leads are, I, it couldn't be anyone else. Like they yeah. are amazing. And the supporting yeah. characters, it's, it's all really yeah. dialed in. I was listening yeah. to her talk about her process, you know, and she, I really like this about directors uh, like her and Ruben Oslin. Like they spend a lot of their production budget on time. So for her with this movie, like they would do set deck. They would have a full day where the set was ready and she would bring. I don't think that this was able to happen for every single scene, but for a lot of the scenes, like she would pad the shoot day with a day before where she came in and just like kind of rehearsed and improv around the scene with the actors in that space. And that's, mm. I mean, the actors are incredible, but I, I attribute a good performance always to the environment that a director sets up because you've seen good yeah. actors in bad roles. I, sure. I uh, love John C. Riley. I love him so much. Mm. And there's very <laughs> few things he can do to like make me wince. But I recently watched that movie, Stan and Ollie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you didn't about, like it? Fuck no. It's so fucking bad. <laughs> First of all, like every bit of Coogan, <laughs> Steve Coogan is couldn't be any worse. Like I love Steve Coogan, but his accent's terrible, dude. It feels like they just got the script and this is a cold reading. And I promise you, like I, I promise you, if you took a peek behind the curtain, they didn't do that process. They didn't go in and like take the time out of the. They didn't take the money out of the budget to give themselves time. And for yeah. whatever reason, I'm not trying to dog the filmmakers. I don't even know who made it. But, like, I was mad disappointed in those two uh, actors. And it's not necessarily mm-hmm. their faults. Those are good-ass actors. But whatever the case may be, that environment that they were doing the work in just did not... It didn't hit for me. And if John yeah. C. Riley is listening to this, dog, I got nothing but love and respect, homie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking it's shit. Coogan, you're, you're a hero, Steve. Coogan, we Steve. love you. Give, us, love give you. us a call. We love you. I'm on the podcast. We love you, Steve. <laughs> Come on, Screen Vomit. Check us out at screenvomit.edu. Thank you. I've been so good not to fucking talk shit about something specific, but we're nearing the end of this podcast, and I just had to say that. (laughs) Sorry. Did the shit on one movie before we got Stan and Ollie is the movie I'm going to shit on. Stan and Ollie. I saw Um, it in the theaters. I didn't. I remembered enjoying it, but I don't. I don't. It's been a long. I saw it in theater, so it's been several years. I don't have any specific memory of like performance or anything at this point. And that probably, you know, that yeah. speaks to the power of the theater too. I might have felt differently had I watched it at the Egyptian on my birthday with twenty friends. Maybe there's like an energy <laughs> right. around it that allows you to kind of get into it. Yeah. But yeah. watching it from my bed, like on canopy on my projector, I was like, man, miss me with this bullshit. This is so <laughs> bad. And all I could think were that, like, the real Stan and Ollie are somewhere in the afterlife watching us, just doing this. Mm-hmm. That's wrong. Just like, <laughs> what the fuck did these guys do to us? But yeah, they were given so much time in, yeah. in this film, in Tony Erdman. Yeah. I read up to 60 takes of each shot yeah. sometimes. Which That's is, insane. Which is funny. I like that we're talking about this this aspect of the movie, uh, the performance aspect, and the, just the theory behind it. Again, like Ruben Oslin does that, does like 60 mm-hmm. takes. Fincher is famous for doing that. And then you, I mean, I'm not necessarily a massive fan of this guy. I respect him more than I maybe like his movies, but he is a great actor. Clint Eastwood does like one or two takes max, right? Mm. On every movie. So I think that the performance in his movie from um, Richard Jewell by that actor um, that plays Richard Jewell, I'm blanking on it, Paul something. He's so good in that movie. Mm. And I remember. Yeah, and... You know, it's Clint Eastwood, so he probably got one, two takes, max, and he still killed it. Like, he still knocked it out of the park. So I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule for how to get a good performance out of an actor. I don't think that there is. 60 takes or no. one take, it's it's about something else in a way. But Paul Walterhausen. Paul Walterhausen. He's awesome. <laughs> He's such a good actor. Maybe a lot of that just lies on his preparation before the the day and their conversations yeah. and the work that they did before they got to set. Yeah, I think we've all seen movies go both ways. Like some people yeah. have no budget and 
no time and just do what they can in one or two takes and come out with amazing shit. And some people have all the time in the world, all the money and do a billion takes. And I don't know. That's the other thing. Is that lasting? (laughs) That's the other thing about doing 60 takes. I've directed scenes where we've done a lot of, a lot of takes. There's a, a part of dog leg that we cut out that's going to exist in a different movie now that Michael and I did in Mississippi Mm -hmm. with some non-actors that are very talented people, right? And we knew that we wanted to just kind of wear them down and get, (laughs) get something get something loose out of them, right? And to do that, we needed to really sit with that scene for the whole night and not focus on coverage. We never moved the camera until we felt like we could. But we did Mm -hmm. probably 20-something takes of a long-ass scene, like 10-minute scene. It took forever. We just did it, did it, did it. And when Michael and I were watching back at the performances, it's not so easy to pick what's good and what's bad. Like you kind of get lost in lost in the sauce, lost in the sauce. And you don't really you're (laughs) not able to see the forest for the trees at some point. So I think it takes a special editor and a a, a skillful director to do that 60 take thing and then pluck out exactly what's the best moment that fits the film. I feel like that would be a nightmare. Did you see you posted it? So I'm guessing you saw Bar Snakes. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. So Bar Snakes was just a one shot scene and um, Mm -hmm. we wanted the the camera zooms to almost feel like the edit, but not to cut. Mm -hmm. And Michael, don't you remember we were going back and forth between like two different takes and both takes were just different and would have been completely different movies had we gone with the other one. And it wasn't because we were improving it like it was all scripted. So we're doing the same beats. We're doing the same stuff. But there's something different about this other take that we liked a lot. You know? yeah. yeah, and I think that's, yeah, to sort of tie back to Tony Urban, I think, like, so there's certain movies that are playing with more, like, the camera's not moving around a lot. Like, I mean, there's certainly, she's doing some cutting in this movie, but a lot of scenes just play out in real time, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. with more- a lot of times and if you do that you're gonna get great little things out of the scene and then things that just don't work Mm -hmm. and it's a little bit like in music when you're not stitching it together so tightly you know a lot of films they just get in the best bits and editing it right and getting a good rhythm and they can they get all the money in the world so they can get all you know these editors to just work 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 and stitch something that's passable together but you're kind of doing a tightrope walk if you're doing these longer scenes and something like bar snakes. It's like one scene, you guys kind of played it a little funnier. Mm -hmm. You know, the next one you played it a little darker. The Mm -hmm. third one, you played it a little, a bit of both and a little bit of that. And this beat hit that. And and you kind of have to just pick one of the three Mm -hmm. because you're all in on not cutting. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. when you do that, you get more idiosyncrasies in it, just like in a song where you're not stitching it all together and making it perfect. Right. Yeah. some parts are out of tune. Some parts are perfect harmonies, but mm-hmm. kind of got a grab back thing. And and I think she must be doing that if she's doing these sixty takes, right? Like yeah. she's finding in one of those that's some kind of magic. And maybe that's take sixty. Maybe that's take one. Mm. But mm-hmm. you've got to kind of do all of them to get there. I do want to. I do want to say one thing that that Al is a bit of a tyrant on set and likes to. Pull some kind of, you know, Stanley Kubrick, Shelley Duvall sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Starve people and like. (laughs) So that's why your street people were getting a little um, losing it towards the end of your shoot night that one night. Mm -hmm. That's just a philosophy you have. Just you're a type like order. Order. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I don't want people laughing. I don't want people on their phones. I don't want people drinking water. I definitely yeah. don't want craft services. Fucking, we got bananas and gum. Get that out of here. All right. Yeah. I want an environment that feels a lot like war um, yeah. in the mm-hmm. trenches, right? Sterile. Sterile. Emotionless. Blank slate, you know. Blank slate. Yeah. Okay. You're in the emergency room with no the comforts. fluorescent light blasting on you. You're in a bed with no sheets and you're mm-hmm. just hearing the click of the, the beep of the fucking heart monitor. That's how mm-hmm. my sets feel. You make them wear an in ear monitor with. A beep in it just so that they feel that tension and it's like a metronome isn't it it kind of yeah. keeps them clicking to the fucking seriousness of the moment mm-hmm. and keeps them also conscious of their mortality there you go my work here is done you just nailed it <laughs> people are like oh al why are you I such, a, why are you such a tyrant asshole why don't we have craft services why do i have this metronome in my ear and if they could just listen to this moment of the podcast <laughs> then they would know so i'm gonna just start going you know what Check out Screen Vomit episode <laughs> 698 featuring <laughs> myself and Michael Bible at one hour and 59 minutes and four seconds into it. And you'll know what I'm getting at. <laughs> 
And you're we're, we're giving up this. We're giving up the special sauce a little bit. That's how, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's how it's made. But because Vanity yeah. Fair is calling me daily, and they're like, "How did you get these performances in Dogleg Rolling Stone? We'll talk, what are you we'll the are, are you the next Paul Thomas Anderson?" And I'm like, "Get out of here! Get out of my fucking face!" <laughs> You won't need to keep doing all these interviews. No. I mean, people are pounding at your door. You've done it. All right. The information's out there. Let yeah. the work speak for itself. You yeah. Know? <laughs> exactly. All right. So I think we've pretty much wrapped up this movie. Do we have any further thoughts on this or we can start rating this out of five? Wow. Any further See, this thoughts? is where I'm a little tricky. I, the rating thing is, is tough for me. But I will say um, big fan of Maren Otta. I don't know what she's got coming up next, but she takes a long time between her movies. Michael and I were looking at her her fucking filmography. I always call it discography for some reason. Her filmography, and she made a movie before this, which is also... Yeah, she's got a couple other films, I think. Right, yeah. right. I haven't the, seen them. This movie that she made in 2009 is called Everyone Else. And it's way more serious and kind of like brooding in a way that doesn't have this comedic payoff that said it's really good i really liked it a lot oh you watched it yeah a a while back it's been a long time but i think it was showing on movie for for a while Mm. and just again like really good performances she won the jury prize at berlin for it it's very like serious and sexy but great yeah yeah is it horny it's pretty horny yeah Mm, i don't know if i'm allowed you might not be allowed you might want to ask your your landlord about that <laughs> I have to ask my landlord yeah <laughs> uh, one thing I didn't mention that I almost forgot about was that they did start talking about doing an American remake of this yeah in uh, 2017 I think that that's over there was like um, Lena Dunham was gonna write it and direct it maybe or adapt it I guess and direct it and then she fell off and Jack Nicholson was going to be the guy and he fell off wow. and then I kind of haven't seen any further articles about it uh, that I could see past 2018 so. you know I'm very wary of that type thing you can just look at Downhill uh, the spinoff from oh, Force God. Majeure but listen yeah, I, I will say that. if there was one guy that could do Tony Erdman some justice and give it some new life I would say it would be Jack Nicholson right yeah and Kristen Wiig was going to be the the girl. See, I don't, daughter. I don't, I don't know about that now. You don't like her? <laughs> no, I don't. I like her, but does she have that kind of? Um, I think more than anything, her casting would probably be just because she looks similar to the daughter, not necessarily based on her acting expertise. You know who would be great? Would who? be you know in Better Call Saul. Mm, I haven't watched it. Yeah, the opposite. Um, the blonde? Well, oh, yeah. No, no, no. I don't agree. She's great. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would pick someone like that you wouldn't expect at all, like Michelle Williams, who's never mm. in like a comedic thing. And I think that that would like she's like a serious actor, you know? Yeah. And maybe she could do it. I don't know, though. Yeah, I don't know. I'm glad that they kind of killed just that. Just don't make it. Just don't, don't do it. That. Don't yeah, make I'm it. We're casting yeah. a movie are ardently against somebody. <laughs> yeah. I think don't make it. I hate that idea of like. Everything doesn't have to be remade for Americans. I mean, no. the film itself is a piece of art and it yeah. should be respected for what it is. Agreed. Totally um, agreed. Yeah. Uh, so that was just another, the last fact. All right. Do we want to rate this? Rate it out of five. I'm, I'm going to, out of five, mm-hmm. it's got to be like a four, eight. Mm. Well, we do have their holes. You got to commit four and a half or five. I, I, if, if I have to go whole, I'm going five, five. This is one of my favorite movies. I love it. Hell yeah. It's, I think it has a rare like comedy to like pain ratio that a lot of other <laughs> movies don't have. Mm-hmm. And these amazing set pieces that I'm just addicted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, it's one of those things where it's like a movie I always recommend to people and they always love it. And it seems like it's kind of universal. So I, I'll put it up five, five. Mm. Hell yeah. Al, what do you think? I mean, one of the things I love most about Michael is that his taste is generally very similar to mine. And uh, I'm going <laughs> to go ahead and copy my boy and give it a 5-5 five, five as well. Hell you yeah. You pick this movie. <laughs> yeah, you did you pick say? the movie. I did pick the movie. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't, how could I critique it? Like, okay, are there moments if we were like sitting down frame by frame where I'm like, oh, you could have cut that. Or I don't know, maybe. But like as a whole, I don't know what I would take away from it. I don't know what I would. Even the moment that you picked out Kayla that you were like that mm-hmm. rang false to me for me that I liked it a lot it really worked yeah. I love the casting I love the pacing I love the beginning and ending I'm a you know I think 
Uh, mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in beginnings and endings, and I think that she nails both. I love the credits song. It's just that it's that Cure song, and it just it feels mm-hmm. fucking cathartic and sad and yeah. hopeful and kind of depressed. And it's the same tonality that the movie has in a pop song. It's a perfect movie. And I have some friends that will talk some shit on my enjoyment of this movie. So I know that a 5-5 for some people will be kind of a like, of course. But it's a (laughs) 5 out of 5 for me. Hell yeah. Okay, what about you, Kayla? I think I'm also going to go 5 out of 5. Let's go. I know. Perfect 5s. That's pretty rare. I kind of agree with some of the stuff you were saying, which is like, yeah, maybe there could be spots if you really nitpicked that you could take out here or there. But as a whole, I don't think you could really eliminate anything from this. And I don't think you could really improve anything mm. in this. Um, I think it's it's written really smartly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the ways that they use comedy in this are really unique and interesting. And it's rare for me in a feature to get huge laughs. Yeah, this was just a great movie. It, it was great. and And I also don't typically be loving the longer films. Oh, is that right? So, yeah. Uh, Not your I thing, just, huh? Well, it's like I could watch one three-hour movie or I could watch two hour and a half movies or I could watch three hour long movies or I could watch 50 shorts, you know? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just feel like I'm missing out on more movies if I spend all my time watching long movies. Yeah. Um, and, and also, you know, a lot of the time they don't earn the runtime. Sometimes mm-hmm. they do like this did, but a lot of times you're like, this didn't need to be this long, you know. Um, so I also don't want to waste my time on a movie with a long runtime. And then I've also missed out on watching more movies. <laughs> so Anyway, all that to say that if it it's long and I'm giving it a five, just know that that means extra coming from me. Hell yeah. Know? Hey, right, y'all hell yeah, should both, fives. before we mm-hmm. move on from uh, Mar and Ada, yeah. y'all should both, Michael and Kayla, y'all should both watch this film that she produced from 2017 called Western. Western is about a German construct. Well, it's a German construction worker. They're building a dam in a Bulgarian village and they're interacting with locals and troubles arise. Uh, Valeska Griesebach. Okay. And Marin's company Got produced it. it. But really like power. It's not funny. It's not like a comedy. It's not like Tony Urban at all. It's more brooding. and I more, like the look of it. Oh, yeah. It's it beautiful. It. And it has this kind of dreamy, nightmarish thing going on with it. The acting's so good. It feels like a cousin of Tony Urban if it didn't have the kind of comedic set pieces. Hell yeah. Check that out. All right. I added that to my list just now. Yeah. Now it's time for Scream Vomit. In this next part of the pod, um, we just talk about whatever else we've been watching lately, like other movies, shows, whatever. Um, So what y'all got? What you been up to? Al, you want to go first? Yeah. I just had a long flight last week, and I watched Claire Denis' new film, which is called uh, Both Sides of the Blade. Um, okay. And it stars Juliette Binoche and then Michael, the the actor from La Moustache, Vincent Lindo. Oh, I love La Moustache. Oh, so do we. So good. This movie is super interesting to me because it's playing on like melodrama and dread and jealousy in a way that like feels super unhinged. I don't want to give anything away or kind of spill like what happens or what doesn't happen. But I think Mm -hmm. because she's who she is, Claire Denis is just like great at tension and great at like the cinema of it all. And the two of them, Juliette Binoche and Vincent London. So good. Mm -hmm. So good. And so like, so deep in their performances in their character that it feels like really like a fucked up movie but like now that it's over and i've finished it i want to go back and watch it kind of knowing what i know and see if i feel Mm. different because i'm not sure it's i don't know i don't i don't know if i think it's fucked up actually uh okay so both sides of the blade would be uh, a movie that i saw recently that i really liked really stuck with me okay you can say a couple things if you want, or if you just okay. want to leave with that, you can. Uh, 90 Day Fiance, The Other Way. <laughs> this season is fucking fire. I'm not even kidding. This season is uh, popping the fuck off. I love it. Um, I watched yeah. this uh, Jack Lemon film last week or two weeks ago. 
I think it's one of Billy Wilder's last movies, and it's called Avanti. It takes place in Italy, right? It takes place in Italy, and I was going to Italy, so I watched this. And uh, Billy, yeah, it's Billy Wilder. It's a kind of mature Billy Wilder and Jack Lemmon thing. Like, I mean, there's some slapsticky stuff going on, and it's definitely like got a comedic air to it. But I just really liked it. I love both. I love Jack Lemmon, and I I love Billy Wilder too, but. I watched it because of Jack Lemmon. It was an interesting movie, Avanti. And it's also not of the times. Like, he calls her fat. Like, it's uh, very, like, <laughs> what? Are you canceled for watching this movie? I might be canceled for even mentioning it. <laughs> Last thing I want to say, and this is on some, this is on my real basic bitch, fucking Lululemon. But... <laughs> Y'all, that last, me and Michael already talked about this, but last night's episode of Succession <laughs> was insane. <laughs> All right, now y'all can officially cancel me. I'm canceled Wait, now. Succession isn't a cancel show, is it? No, I but thought I'm, people I'm like lame that. as fuck for talking about an HBO show on this podcast. Like, Oh, that doesn't make you lame. I don't know. Did you see it? No, I don't watch that show. Right. I don't really watch a lot of shows. My wife hates it's, that show. It's shit. not really Succession. Well, I tried watching it. I didn't really get into it. Um, but it's not really Succession specific. It goes back to the thing I said earlier, where why would I spend 90 hours watching a show when I could watch 10 movies in that time? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I just don't really be watching shows. I uh, It's very rare that I'm watching a show. Salute. Um, That's tight. It's just my own goofiness. I like it. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I feel like that makes me sound pretentious, um, but I don't know. It is what it is. I don't really be watching shows. A web series, maybe, if anything, like a mini series. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, not really watching shows anymore. Check uh, out 90 Michael, Day Fiance you if you ever do dip into the shows, though. <laughs> I'm very inspired by your, your watching of shorts. I think that's really cool. I've been doing a challenge for uh, this is the third year, so we're about halfway through the year now, to watch a short that I haven't seen every day, uh, at least one short every single day. Wow. So that's my short of the day thing. It's really just a personal challenge, but then people started hitting me up about how do I find shorts, etc. So I started posting the links every day. But yeah, I've been doing that for three years, and I usually end up watching more than one a day. People wow. know me as the shorts guy. <laughs> That's awesome. The only person on earth who loves short films. <laughs> Damn. I, I think there's like... Uh... I think they're really fun to write. Yeah. So that's really cool that. Sometimes you can do so much more with a short film or you can just tell such different types of stories than you can do with a feature. I mean, it's kind of a totally different thing than a feature. Right? It is. Most of the time. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's just such a fun type of filmmaking that I get to experience and I hope more people do. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from the like writing side, I love. I'm a big short story fan, so it feels like that's the analog. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What have I been watching? I saw um, the newest. I don't know if it's the newest Hong Song Su, whatever is the newest one that's playing here in New York. It's called Walk Up, uh, mm. which is excellent. I saw that a lot. That was the last thing I saw in the theater. We're both huge fans of his. Mm -hmm. You know, he makes a lot of short movies. Yeah, of varying lengths and and has a kind of crazy filmography if you will that mm -hmm. almost it's not exactly autobiographical but you can tell that these certain characters who are filmmakers or writers or sort of creative types like Hong Sung Su you sort of watch them age and so like mm. with each passing chapter you're sort of getting an insight into his life and he's getting older now and his character mm -hmm. slower more like you know kind of thinking about their lives and, and putting some perspective on stuff so that's really cool. And did you like Walk Up? I loved it. And I mm -hmm. think it's it's you know, it's hard to sort of get people into him. There's not a lot of like really great entry points. There's like I maybe there's a lot that you could start with, but there's no perfect movie of his that you could just mm -hmm. point to. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is a pretty good one that does a lot of the like Hong Song Su kind of stuff, but cool. it's still, you know, pretty approachable ish. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a lot of fun and I think a lot like this, like Tony Erdman. It's a totally different experience walking out of the theater on one of these movies. It's just super refreshing. Yeah. And then what else? I watch a lot of Shark Tank. I know. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> I used to watch Jeopardy. And then, you know, when you're back, you can't watch it anymore. Yeah, you can't watch it anymore. You can't watch Jeopardy anymore. We stand with Trebek. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I've been doing that in a little succession. I, I'm like here in New York and watching succession with a bunch of people that work in media, which is a very bizarre mm -hmm. thing. They're, they're very like, they, they see themselves in the show. <laughs> <laughs> 
strange. It's kind of like watching like Sex in the City with a bunch of like twenty year old girls who just moved to New York City or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very reflective of like themselves. Interesting. But you're not part of that. No, I'm not. You're different. I'm not no. Um mm-hmm. I'm just there. But no, uh I could uh read I know this is a film, I guess, but I did read the mustache. The uh, Edward Carrer novel that The Mustache is based on. Oh, I didn't know there was a book. Excellent. Yeah, he's a writer mainly, the director. Oh, cool. Um, and has written a bunch of fantastic books. Recently, one called Yoga. Uh, mm. it's, a, it's a sort of weird hybrid novel. But The Mustache, if you're interested and you like that movie, it's a great, it's a little novella. It's short and funny and weird. Uh, yeah, so that's really great. I'd recommend that for sure. Hell yeah. Uh, that rocks. Cool. Um, all right, I have a couple things. Yeah, what have you been watching? All right, well, first, I watched I, Daniel Blake, which was the movie that oh. won the Palm d'Or instead of this. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that was a good movie. But can I spoil? Have you guys seen it? I, I haven't seen it, and I'm going to. Maybe don't spoil it, okay, but... Okay, I won't yeah. spoil it. Then. Okay, okay. Never mind. I won't say what I was going to say, but wow. what I will say is it's a really good movie. It is really good. And mm. I was like... Because this movie was really good, and that movie beat it. So I was like, I got to see what's better than this movie, right? So, and and did you think this was be- – that Ken – or I, Daniel Blake, is better than Tony Urban? Um, yeah. I mean, oh, just damn. by a hair. Just <laughs> – well, it's different, though, also. So it, it's kind of hard to compare them because mm-hmm. um, they're kind of two different things. Uh, I, Daniel Blake is more of, I don't know, normal. <laughs> Right. It's more normal. (laughs) But it is like a really good story of just like, you know, a guy who like is injured and can't go back to work, but can't get benefits to be off work. He can't get disability or whatever they call it in England. I don't I don't remember. But and just his struggle, him and, you know, he makes friends with another woman and her family who are also in the same struggle of trying to work within these systems that don't really work with the people. And, you know, it's it's a really good story and portrayal of that situation. And it's really like suffocating and gorgeous and and fuck you, you know, and like it it rocks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Can I just say and this is really unfair, but this is honestly the truth. Um, I can't lie. I've been a little bit put off by the title. Like I, I and Daniel if, Blake. Yeah, if it was called yeah. I Tony Erdman, I also would have felt the same way. Something about yeah. I comma like it's just the I comma Daniel Blake as a title. I'm like that sounds like a Sufjan Stevens song to me, and I don't know if I can fuck with that. I get it, but once you get to the scene in the movie, like where that comes from, you go. Actually, this is like powerful and it makes sense. And, right. But you, it's like you have to watch the movie to get the title. But if the totally. title puts you off from watching the movie, then what do you do? Yeah. But it, it does make sense. It's not mm-hmm. It's not just like invented. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense when you see the movie. And I think it's, it's good because it represents a certain moment in the movie. Man, he's done so many movies, Ken Loach. And um, yeah. he's, he's done a whole lot of shit. I think he's famous for that movie Kes, K-E-S. Mm, never seen it. I've never seen it either. I've just always heard about it. Is it about a hawk? Yeah, it's about a hawk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had some of his movies on my list. I don't think I've seen any other of his movies, though. Okay. At this moment. The Wind That Shakes the Barley. I mean, again, I'm sure that movie rocks, but that title is a little bit... <laughs> ah. <laughs> the boy. It's it's yeah. a little boy in the striped pajamas kind of vibe. Yeah. For sure. But I think it's also like a similar story to that, isn't it? It's like Irish oh, working people class. at war. Yeah. Yeah. The one that takes is like, yeah, Northern Ireland. So. Right. Yeah. I'm a sucker for Irish film. I haven't seen that one, though. So is your boy right. Michael Bible there. Okay, what else? <laughs> I have a couple others. <laughs> I watched Working Girls, 1986 movie. Have you seen yes. this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love this movie. It was so good. Another sort of sticking it to the man movie, but it's about sex workers in... Is there like a PC term for <laughs> where they work? <laughs> Is there a PC term for whorehouse? <laughs> it's in the title, in the fucking synopsis, it says upscale Manhattan whorehouse. So <laughs> the escort estate. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if there's a better word for it than that, but uh, yeah, it's about that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and I really, I, I really like that movie, and I think it's really like ahead of its time for 1986. I think it really rocked. You know what? I said I had seen this movie, and I have not. I was thinking of Girlfriends. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good movie too. Yeah, but yeah, it's not Girlfriends at all. Okay. <laughs> it looks steamy. It's I mean, it's about sex workers. 
<laughs> but yeah. it's not really about like it is just like a movie about having like your job being annoying and like hating your boss and everything but like mm-hmm. the job in this movie is being a sex worker so right. it's just like a, a twist on that and yeah i think it's really cool and it's funny and it's it's really interesting cool Recommend. yeah i want to i want to watch this um i watched the new quentin de movie smoking causes coughing oh. have you seen oh shit no but i like him a lot oh my god it's so good i think it's one of his best and i'm a huge quentin de freak mm-hmm. i've seen all of his movies too including the shorts so you like smoking causes coughing i loved it I loved it. I think wow. it's top tier. Damn. It's not number yeah. one for me, but it's t- it's up there. I think it's maybe number two. Like it's really, mm-hmm. really good. Uh, not to oversell it. <laughs> I almost watched um, on that same flight that I watched both sides of the blade. I almost watched Incredible but True, which is his mm-hmm. other movie from 2022. That one I didn't like. You didn't like it? Not really. I know. Mm-hmm. I, I was kind of like, man, I like him, but he's not. You know, he's not immune to making something a little silly. Yeah. and He turns them out sometimes, and that's fine, because he's exploring stuff, you know? He's uh, he's right. he's always engaging his creativity, and I respect that. Yeah. But sometimes it hits, and sometimes it hits less. There's an interesting idea in that movie, but it didn't really hit for me. Okay. But Smoking Causes Coughing is out now on VOD, so uh, you can watch it now in your home, and uh, it's really good. So I do recommend that one. Did you ever see the movie that he made uh, called uh, Reality? Mm-hmm. Crazy movie. Eric Wareheim is in it, and John uh, Heater. I accidentally watched another movie called Reality first because I thought that it was that movie. Like, I clicked on it, and the link, like, went to the wrong movie somehow. Um, so I watched this, like, really <laughs> underground movie by, like, this Chicago director. It was, like, a Bachelorette-style, like, it's a movie, but about, like, a Bachelorette-style thing where they're, like, eliminating women, you know? Mm. But it's, like, a guy who has kidnapped all these women and trapped them in his basement. <laughs> And when they're eliminated, he, like, murders them. Um, But it's shot in the same, like, it has little things on the screen and, like, that, like, twinkly guitar music and stuff. It was really insane. Um, Damn. (laughs) And I watched, like, 30 minutes of that before I was, like, I thought, like, the other thing is, like, I go into movies totally blind as much as I can. So, like, I didn't read a synopsis or anything. So I had no idea what I was supposed to be watching um, yeah. besides that it was Quinn DePio. So I was like, I don't know. Maybe he's, you know, going crazy. So I actually That's I funny. actually watched the entirely wrong movie for a while um, before fixing it for that one. Um, but, wow. yeah, I love Quinn DePio. I have two more if I can. Please. <laughs> okay, I'll try and be quick. I watched Henry Fool, uh, which is a 1997 Hal Hartley movie. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, but I'm obsessed. It's so good. Is Parker Posey in it? Yeah, Parker Posey, James Urbaniak. It's over the top. It was so fun. I'd never even heard of it till it came up on my movie recommended, and mm-hmm. I just really loved it. Henry Fool. Yeah, and that's like a triptych or a trilogy. There's yeah, yeah. Faye Graham. There's more. Mm-hmm. And- I haven't seen yeah, the other yeah, yeah. ones, though. I don't, I don't think I've seen any Hal Hartley movies except for that one. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested to explore his filmography because I really like that. And if any of his movies are more stuff like that, I'm into it. You're in. Yeah, I'm in. That rocks. Yeah. Um, all right. My last thing is a short. And it's a short called Modern Man by mm. Guy Kozak and John Reynolds. Just very funny short. Have me doing is LMAOs. J- yeah. Is John Reynolds the guy that was in Search Party? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I saw them post about it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's really good. It's really funny. It's not that long. It's like seven minutes or something. Cool. It's really, really, really funny. John Reynolds has a lot of good shorts. Yeah, he's made several that are that are really fun. Yeah, he's really funny. I've never seen any of his films. Yeah, Modern Man is really good um, and Excellent. very funny. Cool. Good for LMAOing. Cool. Time for plugs. Y'all need to plug yourselves. Where can people find you? Uh, where can people find your movie news because the movie's not out mm-hmm. yet but where where will the news be etc my personal uh, instagram handle is at indywire and you can just find all of my stuff there i used to be at vice news daily but we got shut down for some other shit <laughs> uh, right around the pandemic oh yeah no my uh <laughs> You can follow me at Al <laughs> underscore Warren underscore on Instagram. We are pushing uh, a lot of ads right now, trying to trying to get people to the theater to see Dogleg. It's playing. This will come out after mm-hmm. it's played, but it's playing this weekend. And uh, 
what else? Michael, are we going to pitch our website that we've been developing? Or are we still in development on that? Yeah, tell them the name of the website. Okay. So the website's called sharktank.com. <laughs> and it's kind of a riff on the show, um, but it features nude contestants. No one is able to wear clothing. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're still in beta testing. This is an but 18 it's going plus really well. website. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, it actually well, is. Yeah, and the idea is they're real sharks. Like you mm-hmm. do your idea for your little invention. And if it sucks, then you go. Then you get it. You might get eaten or the shark might not bite you at all. So. Yeah, yeah, the shark's yeah. also nude? Yeah, the shark is actually clothed in the same suit that mm. Mark Cuban wears. in the. Um, but the contestants are nude oh, just for safety for the sharks. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that makes sense. They don't want to be digesting mm-hmm. all kinds of weird fibers. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. I would say um, I have uh, – well – the, a magazine here in New York is helping us host a screening in Brooklyn called Forever Magazine, and I have a piece in that. And they're also uh, going to push Dogleg at a screening, so I would say to check out Forever Mag. And I have a bunch of three books uh, that are out from Melville House Press. People can check that out, and hopefully, you got a new book coming. New book coming. I, hopefully, uh, people will be able to check out Dogleg here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I'm excited for people to find it. Hell yeah, wherever. <laughs> i'm excited to see it too and kayla i will say too since you're a short film lover um i'm acting in a few short films that are coming out soon one is called middle Size things with eric rayhill okay uh directed by michael reese okay and then one is called trolls with me and betsy brown okay. and uh another actor named carson higgins and that's by robbie barnett okay and then uh i'm also in chris borgley's nicholas cage movie which comes out i don't know when it comes out but it's like his a24 film. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited for that one too. It's good. Hell yeah. That rocks. Well, that's that's basically the end of the show if you guys are done with your pluggies. Done with the pluggies. Done with the pluggies. Well, thank you guys for joining me. Thank you so much for having us. This was a blast. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for having us. Hell yeah. Anytime. All right. Well, um, we'll see everyone next time. Bye. Say bye. Bye. You got to say it. <laughs> you got to say it, Michael. Bye. <laughs> bye. 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 No, it's funny. I, I was just going to say, I feel like for me, like I acted when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, and then I stopped mm-hmm. when I was like 18 and didn't act again really until former cult member. Mm-hmm. And I'm acting uh, with a lot more regularity now. And I'm yeah. just like into it again for the first time since I was a kid. And I think that because of that, I've kind of loosened the reins a little bit on something that I traditionally like wouldn't have watched, like The White Lotus or... Succession, and I, I kind of go into that a show like White Lotus because I like some of those actors. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing for my like watching diet all the time because it can also work the other way where I like someone and I go and watch something of theirs because I've liked them traditionally, and then I it kind of ruins it for me. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, yeah. But sometimes you power through if you really like them. Yeah, but you know, I'm like a Jennifer Coolidge fan from back in the Christopher Guest days. And to see her kind of have this moment, like I I would be remiss not to watch the show and see what she's doing in it because she's so funny and so talented and really unpredictable. And anyway, yeah.